budget hearings Tuesday, April 23rd at approximately 1.03 p.m. Can I have a roll call, please? Present. Here. Thank you. Um, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes from staff? Mr. Chairman, no changes. Okay. Uh, anything from the committee? Okay. Is there a motion regarding the agenda? Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Okay. So I want to, uh, first of all, welcome staff and the uh, other members of the governing body and the mayor to our finance committee budget hearings. We look forward to your presentations today and over the next few days. Um, a couple of uh, kind of house cleaning items or, or rules how we're going to move forward. Uh, I'm going to refer uh, questions to the committee, the finance committee members first, and then I'll allow other members of the governing body to ask questions. Uh, motions and voting will be limited to finance committee members only, though. Um, I, I don't mind if members of the governing body want to ask a member of the finance committee to consider an amendment or changes, but uh, this hearing falls under the purview of the finance committee, and so we're going to make sure that it's the finance committee that is making the motions and ultimately voting on the budget that we recommend to the governing body. Um, we will vote on each individual uh, department as we've done in the past. If it's not ready, then we will postpone until uh, a later date to allow staff to bring back more information if that's what the committee needs in order to make a decision. Um, as far as time, we'll move along as slowly as we need to with the exception of today's union employee remarks. I will stop at 4.30 so that we can hear from AFSCME police officers and fire before we close the day out. But uh, whatever we don't finish today, if we don't, then we'll discuss with the finance committee before 5 o'clock how they want to proceed uh, tomorrow and the next day if, again, we need to with other departments that we don't get to today that are noted on the agenda. Uh, so with that, um, I'm ready to get started. Uh, item number five is our management presentation of our operating budget. So we've got 5A, Mayor and Manager Executive Summary of the Annual Opening Budget. Mr. Mayor, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's nice to see a well-run meeting for a change. Um, I was thinking about this uh, gathering uh, last night and how different it is for me this year from last year uh, when I arrived a few days before the budget was completed and was handed a budget and told it was my budget. Uh, and then when we came into our hearings, I was asked questions and uh, consistently was uh, able to answer, I don't know, and I'll have to get back to you. I expect we'll still have many of those answers today. But I, uh, I first want to start by complimenting the uh, entire team of the Finance Department, the Human Resources Department, and all of our department heads who helped create this budget. Uh, it is uh, a budget that has been put together through a rigorous process, a collaborative process, an iterative process of uh, both exploring the purposes that our departments are designed to serve their overarching values and then digging into their existing programs that need to be continued and supported as well as considering additions uh, to the mission and the uh, programs that are offered uh, in every single department. Um, I think it, it was a tremendous experience for me to be able to participate in it and to see how well the department heads and the finance and human resources department as the, as the uh, spearhead of the effort collaborated. Um, too frequently we see large organizations, public or private, falling into silos where the departments are 
simply looking at their own mission or their own responsibilities and they're not looking across at uh, the shared responsibilities that they have. And the number of times in budget meetings where we would ask a department head, what are your key priorities? And they would end up talking about something that really resided in a partnership with another department was really, um, I think, uh, both inspiring and um, confirmed to me the, the team that has been built and continues to em evolve in the departments in our city. So I, I offer that to you as a kind of backstage pass to what went on for the last very large number of months to build a budget that uh, is fiscally responsible, that uh, takes care of the people who work for the city, and seeks to build better relationships with the unions and the non-union members of our city team. Um, I am very proud of the, the leadership that was shown in putting this document together and the professionalism that went into it. The themes are the ones I highlighted in the letter in, in the front of the book. And that is we start by talking about people first. I think it's uh, been documented by our class and comp study, by the research we've done about the pay that we have provided our uh, safety, public safety personnel, that the city has uh, really unpaid debts that we need to catch up to. We have deferred maintenance in buildings. We also have deferred maintenance in the way we uh, compensate and reward our people. And if you look at the largest increase in this city budget, you will see that it is first and foremost devoted to paying the people of the city who do the work of taking care of the people of the city. And we want this budget to put people first and to be uh, a message to our employees that we value their contributions every single day. We believe that we need to pay them uh, what the market dictates and that we need to build that relationship going forward. And, and this budget is a snapshot in time, but it's not the end of the process. It's rather the beginning of a process of maintaining and building and growing uh, the, the relationships and the compensation strategy. Um, and you will see the numbers of dollars that have been set aside to do that. At the same time, we have programmatic uh, priorities. I think they are, in some cases, uh, value, simply an expression of our values, that we want to unify the city, that we want to treat all parts of the city fairly, equally, and respectfully, and that here again, uh, historically, we may have had deferred maintenance when it came to developing every part of the city and investing in every part of the city as uh, places for all of our people to live, to work, to thrive, to play, to have recreational opportunities and services. And so as the budget unfolds, as the departments present their uh, budget uh, programs, you'll see that the dollars are committed to certain programs, but the story behind those programs is a story of unification, of fairness, of equity, and of healing divides that have too long separated different parts of our city. I think we also are committed uh, consistently in this budget to delivering services to the people of Santa Fe in a way that is faster and better and more responsive to the needs and the desires of people who live and work in Santa Fe. We continue to build the technology platforms to be able to deliver services seamlessly and to track people's requests uh, without any dropped uh, information. We need to invest in things that are often uh, un invisible like software, like information technology, because increasingly, in order to be a smart city, 
we have to be able to have the technology to act in a smart way. We're committed in this budget to sustainability. And as we look at uh, efforts to live our uh, sustainable Santa Fe plan, you'll see more solarization, you'll see replacing of street lights uh, with LED uh, street lights, you'll see the utilization of resources that will make our city really sustainable and respond to the challenge of climate change in a very real way. We had Earth Day yesterday, and at it we were reminded that with climate change, every day needs to be Earth Day. This budget takes that seriously. We also are investing in housing as an overarching priority. When I said that uh, our department heads were thinking across boundaries, it was in, uh, important to me that when our community services director came to speak to the budget uh, uh, meetings, we asked her what the priority for community services was. She said, housing. In order to do the work of taking care of people, we need housing of all kinds across the city. And this budget speaks to our need to do better planning at the neighborhood level uh, in the way we use our capital, our, uh, our assets, whether we're talking about uh, Tierra Contenta or the rail yard or the Midtown campus. Uh, we have assets that we are not, uh, or the Northwest Quadrant that you've spoken about consistently, Counselor. We have assets that the city has on its balance sheet that we have simply not treated uh, in an appropriate, fiscally responsible, managerially uh, uh, strong way. And so the budget opens that chapter, which I think has been neglected as well for quite a while. Uh, I think it's a budget that um, contains a lot of uh, strong uh, efforts to make our own house run better and then to begin incrementally to invest in things for a better future. And I'm really looking forward, uh, Mr. Chairman, to listening to the committee's work and uh, responding to questions when they're di directed to me or when uh, more appropriate, uh, having our, our team of staff people uh, give you the answers. I promise you if we don't have the answers in real time, uh, we'll be taking notes, all of us, and get back to the, uh, with the answers as quickly and effectively as possible. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to open with a few words. Thank you. Ms. McCoy. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, mayor, counselors, I'm not Ms. McCoy, but I'll say a couple of things after um, the mayor has given us a pretty good introduction. Um, he talked about expressed values, talked about people first, talked about equity, talked about sustainability, among other things. What you'll see is those values are, are woven throughout our proposals in this budget. <laughs> it's something that I think we, as a team have come to realize is important for our community. It's important that this budget tell the story and the narrative behind those values. To that end, um, when it comes to people first, we all agree that paying our people right, paying them correctly, had to be the first thing. We had to build a team that was ready, willing, and able to do the things we were asking them to do. To that end, you'll see approximately $4 million dedicated to changing the pay structures to all the employees, the benefit structure to all of the employees in the city. We talk a lot about the class and comp. We realize it is not a perfect document, but we do believe to the core that what we have with class and comp provides us a good starting point from which to build for future years. And you'll see that we recommend implementation of class and comp throughout all four bodies, the three unions and non-union. We recommend some reorganization that's intended not only to to meet the needs of the expressed values, but to make us more efficient and effective in how we do business. You'll see some reorganizations that we propose in land use and recreation to give the leaders in recreation not only modules that seem more functional, but a better way to lead the people, again, who are doing the boots on the ground work. Some reorganization of community services, including adding the public defender and the navigators that, as the mayor said, will help deliver the services that these people so justly need. 
And you'll see some minor tweaks in our reorganization, things like what we're doing with the internal audit, things like what we're doing with risk and safety and with lead and with the creation of an EMS division in the fire department. We're also looking at programs that um, also follow through with these expressed values. In public works, we're looking at project managers, not only for stormwater, but to better plan and, and go through with the projects that we intend to do at the airport. We're looking at an internal service delivery, um, ways to improve our infrastructure. Of course, you've heard about ERP. We'll continue to improve and complete ERP. Now we'll look at improvements to finance, how we do procurement, how we do HR. Really all of our internal service delivery models that'll help us and all the department directors who are in this audience deliver the services that, that do the right work in the city day in, day out. And we'll look at the, the things that support the other values that the mayor has talked about, about housing, about affordable housing, about economic development. We intend, and you'll see in this budget, to make improvements to constituent and council services, something that was started last year and probably got a full day's worth of discussion. Well, it's starting to come to fruition. It's starting to gain form and really starting to deliver good services. With what we propose in this budget, we have a CRM that will help us listen to our constituents and ultimately allow us to be proactive rather than just reactive. It will become more of, of a relationship, not just a way to receive feedback. We look to improve our website, and of course, uh, we look to improve communications, and always we do it. And as you heard in council uh, last session, we look to put safety at the top of everything we do, including uh, a proposal to bring a new safety officer, a proposal to do an outside evaluation citywide of our best practices, our, pra our current practices, and what should be our best practices. Uh, and then you'll see things in our public safety, um, like how we're creating career paths in, in the police department, how we're giving them incentives to stick around, giving them something to start with before they're 18 and all the way to the end of the career. How we're recognizing that EMS is becoming over 80% of what the fire does and creating an EMS division to support that. I, like the mayor, believe this budget um, shows strong collaboration. It's something we've worked on for many months. Um, I'm super proud of what the finance department has done to create this budget in collaboration with everybody who's sitting in this audience. Um, as, as I started with, I'll end with, which is to say the values that the mayor talked about, the values that I think you as a governing body believe in are woven throughout this budget. I think it's something that throughout the next few days and two weeks uh, we can all come to understand and I look forward to the dialogue and questions and answers that you all are, are going to have with us. Thank you. So we'll kick off the budget presentation with an overview of the FY20 recommended budget to set the context for the series of hearings that we will have over the next few weeks. So first I wanted to give you um, an idea that the, this budget increases um, the investment but balances that with uh, fiscal responsibility. Through the budget development process, the city staff as the mayor and the city manager have discussed took a deep dive into each line item and have really done a great job at reviewing and determining if expenditures are one-time expenditures, they have been removed, if they are recurring expenses, if uh, the recurring nature is appropriate to continue moving forward at the same level or if it warrants an, an increase in investment or a decrease in investment. So that is what we hope to review with you over the course of the next few weeks. Areas where the dollars were saved allowed those dollars to be reinvested in high impact areas. And this mayor and the city manager have identified a few of those for you already. And as Bernadette will review with you, um, the FY20 budget provides significant investment in the city's most valuable resource, our own employees. In addition to reserving for collective bargaining increases, for the first time in at least 10 years, the city is proposing to fund changes to the existing classification and compensation plan. And as our staff will review with you over the course of the next two weeks, the FY20 budget funds many investments that have been prioritized by the governing body and by our residents, including our neighborhoods, our parks and recreation centers, public safety, modernizing our government, building an eco-friendly city, and ending homelessness. 
among others. I want to highlight for you the City of Santa Fe's uh, fiscal responsibility. As you know, the current, in the current fiscal year, S&P has, and Fitch as well, has affirmed our double A plus rating. Many of the core tenants you see listed here, including conservative budgeting, strong fiscal management, are the reasons why we are able to maintain a strong credit rating. On the next slide, you'll see some of the testaments that were included in our assessment from S&P and Fitch ratings. With the AA plus rating, S&P and Fitch both confirm the city's strong financial resilience. The underlying economic fundamentals, which includes strong tourism industry and the stabilizing presence of the state capital, has led to growth in sales tax. The ratings agencies also recognized several ongoing developments in the city, including addition of multiple medical centers, the development of various apartment units and senior living facilities as a strong point in our economic outlook. I share this with you today to show the stable financial conditions we are currently experiencing. This overview will provide the economic and revenue context as you review the FY20 recommended budget over the next few weeks. Christina Keyes, the city's treasurer, will review the next few slides with you to provide the economic and the revenue background for the city. Following that, Brad Fletch, the city's financial planning and reporting officer, will detail the city's expenditures for all funds and for general fund. And we will highlight for you the general fund reserves that we will be maintaining to continue the stable financial outlook and, res and financial resilience. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Um, if we could continue on the presentation, um, you'll see the next pie chart, which shows the FY20 recommended revenue. Is it? Of course. Thanks. Get things adjusted just as we're starting out. Okay. The FY. The FY20 recommended revenue is approximately $377.4 million. In this budget that is being presented continues the trend of the city's resilience on GRT revenue. As you'll see in the pie chart, the lion's share of the revenue that's received by the city, 39%, is local state shared taxes, which comprise the GRT, property taxes, franchise fees, lodges tax, and gasoline tax. And within the next year or so, it'll also include forthcoming internet sales tax application from the site. For additional color and information regarding revenue and the different revenue sources and types, um, I'll refer you to the budget book. And on page 29 is where the detail is located. Um, so if you have any questions or comments regarding any of these revenue sources um, or would like additional detail, please let me know and I can follow up. Um, if we go to the next slide, slide six, um, you'll see the graph which provides the major components of revenue um, over the course of FY16 through our present fiscal year and into FY20. Um, the local and state taxes share of total revenues has increased from 27% to 39%. There's been a significant growth and influx of revenue from that, those sources. Um, the next page will show you the GRT revenue growth in particular, which is our largest revenue source. Um, during the Great Recession, the city's GRT revenue declined 13.9 million in two years alone. In turn, it took seven years to recover from pre-recession GRT levels, as you'll see in the chart below. FY18 provided 110.8 million, and to date, 
FY19 budget is at 105.6 million. Fiscal year to date gross receipts tax distributed to the city of Santa Fe through April through last week is a total of 95.6 million. And this is 8% over fiscal year to date 18. On the next chart, or next slide, you'll see the next chart, which provides the major components of revenue. Um, property taxes, in particular, have increased nearly 20% from FY17 through FY18. Um, this increase may be attributed to record level home sales within Santa Fe, as well as a continued demographic movement of the influx of relocating retirees, as well as younger boomerang generation who grew up here, it were educated out of state, gained some work experience, are now relocating back home. So we are benefiting from this population growth within the city. And on page nine, we will go into the FY20 recommended expenditures. Um, most of the budget in the following two weeks are going to be on expenditures, so this is a very high level. This is, um, we'll, we'll be into far more detail in the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, to start off, um, public utilities is by far our largest uh, department uh, with expenditures just under $70 million at $69.1 million. And that's followed by public works. And public works is, you know, in a lot of ways, our construction company. And so not only do they have an operating budget of $47.6 million, but we also have a capital budget of nearly $80 million this year, which is in your budget book. Um, as far as the bigger changes, ITT has the largest percentage increase at 37.1% in the budget. Uh, Human Resources has the largest dollar increase at 4.3 million. Uh, one of the quirks in, in the um, ITT budget is last year, the reason why the large variance is, is last year, the, or I should say this year, the um, ERP project was funded in the capital budget, and we did a bar in uh, late December. This year, or next year, um, the ERP is in the operating budget, and so this $3.1, $3.2 $3 that the city's investing in ERP is reflected now in the ITT operating budget, where it was not last year. That's, and that explains 100% of the increase in ITT. Um, in the HR budget, um, that is where, uh, the reason why they had such a large increase, half of that increase is uh, the collective bargaining reserve for uh, non-utility working ASCII employees, police and fire. Um, and so, because we didn't want to impact the general fund, utility ASME employees have a reserve in water, wastewater, and environmental services. So that way we didn't impact, overburden the, the general fund in the budget. Uh, Non-departmental, um, the other big impact to HR, excuse me, is that uh, we removed the safety uh, portion of risk and safety out of finance and move that into HR. Um, things like OSHA and drug testing and, and safety, things that you would think an employer would, would do or in a safety perspective really didn't belong in finance. It really belonged, its natural home is HR where it belongs. And so in this way, we're reorganizing the right way and putting things where they belong. And, and that accounts for uh, the other half of HR's income. Non-departmental had the largest decrease, 33.7 million. K 
10 million of that is BDD is not in this budget and uh, we have not received one from them. Um, SWAMA had a decrease of 2.7 million and that's mainly in repair and maintenance and a uh, million dollars less in equipment purchases. So their SWAMA's budget's down from 11.8 million to 9.1 million in the proposed budget. Uh, public Utilities had the, or excuse me, uh, Public Works had the, the next large, or no, it was Public Utilities um, had the next largest decrease at 12.2 million. And again, this is a, an internal change. We changed the way we uh, process uh, utility billing, customer service, and how we allocate that expense to the other utilities. And uh, it's not really a decrease, it's just that we, instead of, uh, doing an expense, we did a transfer. Um, uh, so as public ut uh, utility billing collects the monies and provides services to the other departments, um, we transfer back out to them the revenues that uh, utility billing needs to balance its budget. And other than that, I look forward to the next couple weeks to discuss in detail all of the expenditures. Okay, so does that bring us to the employee compensation and benefit changes? One change that I would like to highlight uh, for the committee is the general fund uh, reserves level. So this has been a question that we've received in the finance committee, so I wanted to highlight this as well. So while the FY20 recommended budget uh, for the general fund totals $104.9 million in revenue, the expenditures total 102.4. So this difference uh, we are actually putting into the reserve to shore up the reserves to the 10%, which is the city council mandated 10% reserves. Just wanted to highlight that. So although we have um, the 20 budget does support an increased investment, we are also being fiscally responsible by ensuring that we have sufficient reserves to withstand, building up our reserves and sufficient reserves to withstand the next downturn in the economy. And so now we will move on to, you know, given that the, lar as you can tell from the uh, pie chart, that the largest percentage of the general fund uh, expenditures are with salaries and benefits. Uh, Bernadette is going to give an overview of the increases for uh, the salary and benefits for our employees this year. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. As we discussed earlier, uh, this year's recommended budget is placing a high priority on our most valuable resource, our employees. So with that, um, our recommendation is to uh, implement the classification and compensation study um, as recommended by the consultant. This also includes funding the collective bargaining increases that are currently in place. 2% pay increase for AFSCME employees, a 2% pay increase for fire union employees, along with a 1% longevity pay increase, and allocating approximately $930,604 for police negotiations for sworn police officers, and approximately $158,000 for civilian uh, police union employees. This will also include a 2% pay increase for all non-union, non-probationary employees, effective the first full pay period in July. And uh, during this legislative session, there was also a bill that was passed to increase the PERA contributions that employers pay uh, for their employees to the tune of 0.25%. That will increase our budget uh, about approximately 80,000 uh, for one year, and um, that's that's included in our recommendation. Back to the class and comp study, I would like to um, identify those numbers. For non-union employees, uh, the allocated dollar amount would be approximately 436,000, and for AFSCME employees, the allocated dollar amount would be approximately 963,956 dollars, excuse me, um, would be allocated for AFSCME employees.
the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about um, the health and dental benefits that the city offers to all of our employees. And in the chart um, on slide 12, you'll see that there's been an increase of approximately 62% from FY11 to the proposed uh, FY20 uh, recommendations for rates. Um, we do have our benefits consultants here, um, our uh, consultants from Aon, and they will be presenting some detailed information about our plan, the status of our plan, and the recommendations moving forward. Um, on slide 13, there's also some more information. Again, Aon, our consultants, will go into more detail about this, and uh, you may have more questions about that. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to our Aon consultants at this time. present. Uh, the information that we just passed out is kind of the, the background and the details behind um, how the renewal was um, justified. And to tell a story ar around the supporting the increase that is being um, presented to you today. So my name is Don Montano. I'm a consultant with Aon. And then I've got Todd Burley, who is our financial manager. He is going to go through most of the financial cal calculations to explain um, why the dental plan and the medical plan are calling for an increase for this year. Mr. Mayor, members of council, if you'll go to page three, I want to give a brief history of the health insurance accounts. We will focus on columns A through D, and I cannot read the row numbers, but the fourth row from the bottom. As you can see, when the city moved to Cigna in July of 15 in column D, it ran a surplus of about $1.9 million, which was um, driven into the health fund. The next year, there was a surplus of almost $800,000. In fiscal year 17-18, it was basically break even. And for the current fiscal year, through the end of February, there is about an $800,000 deficit in the health fund comparing revenues to expenditures. If you recall last year, a, uh, an increase of, of about 3.5% was recommended. It was determined that that should be delayed and any, any shortfall would be taken from the health fund. The expected shortfall was about $600,000. questions on that page, we'll move on to page four. Row two, the, the total medical cost for projected for this fiscal year is about 19 million. For next fiscal year is a little less than 21 million for a difference of 1.9 million. 
In row five, the dental has run at a deficit for the last eight or 10 years. No changes have been made to the funding component of that. We'll go over that in more detail in a few pages. No changes really to the other coverages. If you go to the bullet points at the bottom of the page, what's really influencing this is there are significantly more high cost claimants over the last four years. Four years ago, it was about 1.3 million in claimants over 125,000, it's risen to about 2.2 million in the last couple of fiscal years. For the medical fund, the city has not increased funding over the last four years, so neither the city nor the employees have increased funding since 15-16. So again, this has resulted in a deficit mainly in this current fiscal year. One comment I wanted to point out is on the right-hand side of that page, we provided for you some benchmarks of um, how your renewal increases have compared to what we're seeing on a national trend basis. So while you have maintained your costs with no increase for the past uh, three years, you can see nationally um, the increase has have ranged from 3% upwards of 4.5%. So you have run really well um, compared to what we've seen across the nation um, for benefit increases. Page five, this, this shows at a high level the, the, um, the city's share of this increase. Uh, projected for the current fiscal year is 14.6 million. For next fiscal year, it's 16 million. The city pays roughly 76.5% medical costs. So that's an increase of 1.436 million. Dental, again, has been underfunded for the last eight to 10 years. The city share, assuming an 11.4% increase was instituted, would increase from 590,000 to 656,000, an increase of 67,000 for a total increase in the city's costs of 1.5 million. So questions pages six and seven just show the methodology behind determining the increase. Essentially, what I do is take the last 24 months of data, subtract any high cost claimants. The city has stop loss coverage through Cigna at a $250,000 level. So for any claimants that exceed that amount in a fiscal year, the city pays the first 250,000 and then Cigna pays any amount above that. So really, that just shows the derivation of the 9.9% .9 increase. Page eight just shows the split between the city share and the employee share. If you go to page nine, the highlighted yellow section on the right, shows what the employee per paycheck con or monthly contributions would be per paycheck are in columns L and M. So you can see at the 9.9% increase, the per paycheck change for employees for a single employee would be a little less than $8 up to about $19 for a family. So that's for the non-union and ASHA. Page 11 shows the same information for the union, for the fire and police. Roughly the same dollar amount increases out there in column N, ranging anywhere from $9 to 20, almost $21 per paycheck. So when you look at pages uh, 12, 13, and 14, this is taking your current plan designs that are offered to the employees. Page 12 is um, focusing on the premium plan. Um, we have the non-union AFSCME plan, which is in column A, the police plan, and in column B and column C is the fire plan. There are some minor benefit differentials, and so ultimately, um, between the three different plan designs you offer, there's ultimately nine plans being managed by your HR team. 
One thing that we did include for you for reference here is a benchmark, just so you compare um, how your plans benefits align up with other government entities, which include um, state governments, municipalities, other counties um, across the U.S. So you can see um, how generous your benefit offering is from what the members pay out of pocket at time of service that you're offering. Um, for, and so page 12 is the premium plan, page 13 is the core plan, the same format, and page um, 14 is for your um, value plan, the HRA plan. So on page 15, ba based on the richness of the plan, particularly the premium plan of which more than 95% of the employees are enrolled, we modeled some benefit changes to project some potential savings to the city if these changes were implemented. So if we were to increase the physician co-pays from the current $15 PCP and $30 specialist to 20 and 40, that would save about $67,000 per year or half a percent. Out to the far right is the benchmark. You can see the city's benefits are significantly higher than benchmark, which are currently $28 for a PCP visit and $50 for a specialist. Next row shows the same information for the hospital Copay, current city copay is, or is $250, increasing that to $500 would result in $27,000 in savings. The benchmark on this is a little tricky in that most of the benchmark plans have a 20% coinsurance along with a deductible. That would be closer to a $1,000 copay, but for the ones that do have a copay, it's $250. Increasing the outpatient hospital from 125 to 250 would be a $23,000 savings. Increasing the ER copay to $200 would be a $33,000 savings. Pharmacy fourth tier, what this means is that for specialty drugs, for those really high cost biopharmaceuticals, changing that copay from the current $40 to a, to a percentage with a minimum and maximum would result in $35,000 in savings, and really the change that would really have an impact to the city's costs in NA fiscal year is implementing a deductible and some coinsurance. So implementing a $250 deductible with 20% coinsurance would be about $700,000 in savings. That deductible and coinsurance would pay for your or would apply to the inpatient and outpatient hospital and lab and x-ray. Segwaying into page 16, why are, why are these changes important and why should the city begin to consider reducing the benefits? If you recall back in 2010 when the Affordable Care Act was first enacted, there was what at the time was referred to as the Cadillac tax until Cadillac rightly took offense to that. So it's now the excise tax. And what the, the basis behind that was if if you were paying more than $10,200 for single coverage or $27,500 for family coverage, the city would have to pay a 40% excise tax on any amount above that. That was supposed to start in 2018. Fortunately, it was pushed back to 2020 and then again to 2022. And the, uh, those minimum amounts are, are indexed. So what we think is that in 2022, those will be at the bottom of page 17, 11,237 and 30,295, if it actually is enacted in 2022. So what does this mean? Flipping to page 18, the city would already have crossed the threshold for the for both police and fire, if you look at that year crossing threshold call, a third column from the right. So in 2022, they would already be above that threshold. The only one that is not is the family non-union. So what that means is that in 2022, we estimate that the city would be subject to $233,000 in excise tax. Assuming no benefit changes and standard medical 
cost increases over the 10 years following that, the city would be responsible for almost $12.5 million in excise tax. And the excise tax is solely based upon the cost of your program, not the richness of the benefit, just money out the door for your program. And if you look at page 19, you can see the graph on the left. The red bars are the excise tax. The beige bars are the estimated costs. And what the table on the right shows is for each year the expected amount at this point that the city would pay in excise tax. That's in that third column from the left, starting at 233,000 and increasing to 21 million for any of us who are still around in 2022. Any questions on that? We pay $20 million in excise tax on $400 million in So this is a pr provision that um, right now is um, looking at 2022 to be implemented. It, you know, uh, the, it's been delayed twice, so that could be a very um, strong possibility of happening again. But it's something that we need to keep in the back of the mi our minds because, as you can see, the penalties are pretty um, significant for the city, and so we need to have discussions around what steps we need to take to help you to avoid those penalties because I'm sure you as um, the governing body do not want to be budgeting for those types of increases nor do you want to be um, sharing that cost with your with your employees so we bring this to your attention because it's something that we're going to have to develop a plan for over the next few years and then as the government um, passes the legislation defines all the rules around it then we know really what we're dealing with and how we can address it but we need to start having those discussions now because it really impacts your union plans right off the bat and uh, you know I know there's some constraints in your union contracts around changes that can be made so we need to have to around how do we address this to avoid the city and its employees facing these penalties because the cost will have to be coming out of your budget and since they pay for part of the cost of the health plan you know it'll impact them financially as well mr. chair yes can I ask a question yeah I think you're pretty much that concludes your presentation right we just had a couple points on dental to support that. Do you want to wait till they make those That's points or? Okay, let's make those points and then we'll start with questions from the committee. Mr. Chair, members of the council, really quickly, dental on pages 20 and 21. Uh, the box on the left of page 20, again, dental funding has not increased in at least 10 years and has run a deficit of roughly $100,000 for the last five to 10 years. Implementing an 11.4% increase in our estimation would eliminate that deficit going forward. And although that sounds like a huge increase, if you flip to page 22, columns L and M out to the right, you can see that that per pay period change ranges from 66 cents a paycheck for an employee only up to $1.69. And just quickly going through the pages, vision, life and disability, there's no change in costs. One concern we do have with your life and disability plan is the way the program is structured today. The city does share in the cost of the basic life and the voluntary life. The um, city picks up a portion of that uh, premium and the employee is picking up a portion of that premium. Traditionally in, um, in the marketplace, we don't see employers contributing to the cost of the voluntary life insurance benefit. It's called voluntary, meaning that the employee picks up the entire cost. Um, it, this was brought to our attention because I, there was an audit recently that has raised some issues and taxable liabilities. Um, and so this does need to address, so this is gonna be another item that we need to talk further on, on what makes sense to change the structure because um, it impacts the taxable liability for your employees, but also for the city. And so this is something we've included on our list of action items on page 26. So a couple of things we, we um, need to address today is um, the increase to the premiums. Um, we have to finalize the renewal contract with Cigna. 
Uh, the employer contributions that we presented were basically matching the same structure that's been in place. Um, some future items that we need to discuss further is um, looking at that life, instru life insurance structure, um, discussing about the excise tax and having a plan in place um, to make changes to your plan designs to avoid that tax. Um, and then also there was some discussion around maybe making some changes in the contribution structure for the core and mm -hmm. HRA plans to make those less, uh, more cost affordable for the employees, uh, like a lower cost sharing out of their paycheck for those plans to drive a little bit more participation into those programs that have higher out-of-pocket costs um, at time of notice. So that, that is everything that we had today. So. Um, we're happy to answer any questions regarding any of the presentations. Okay, uh, Councilor Romero Worth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question on the um, excise tax and, and the delay. When has that delay, um, what time of year have we known that it would be delayed? Are you familiar with that? And how does that fit in with our budget cycle and it, it, it has come at different times of the year. The yep. last delay came at the tail end of a calendar year. Um, it, it just depends on, on the federal government. Um, what we've been seeing when it goes into an election year, they tend to delay it and have it become effective when the next president is coming in place. So it becomes a future president's issue with um, defining that regulation. So usually it's a, a couple of delays have been more on the latter part of the calendar year. Okay. Mr. Chair, Councilor Romero Worth, if you look at page 17, the second and third bullet points, it's usually coupled in with another act and just thrown in as kind of a side measure. You can see the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the first extension, and then again, the Continuing Appropriations Act in 2018. So I think it just varies with whatever legislation appears that through the federal government at that time. Okay, that's my only question for now. Councillor Harris, do you have any questions? I just need uh, clarification. So uh, I'm looking at page five, and these are this is information we were provided in our packet, and there's obviously a lot of information to try and absorb here, but these proposed uh, increases, um, these are the, this, this is the monies from the city of Santa Fe, correct? This would be the city of Santa Fe. This, this is the city of, of the annual. This is the city of Santa Fe. And did we see a number? Uh, we saw various, I guess it shows up in, oh, for instance, uh, on page nine, medical contributions what it would mean for the different plans. So is this, is the 1.5 comparable uh, to what is, what the employees see as well? Mr. Chair, Councilor Harris, the, on a percentage basis, yes. It, it is split equally at that 9.9% .9 increase. The city pays roughly 76.5% of the total amount to employees for the on a dollar basis, it's about three to one. Three to one. But on a percentage basis, they both see the same nine point nine. Right. Okay. Oh, now I'm now I'm starting to understand. So, so this one point five represents the city's seventy six percent, approximately. Chair, Councilor Harris, correct. If you go to page four in column E, row two, the one point nine million dollars. That's the total increase, including both the city's share and the employee's share. So 1.878. Page four, you say? Four, column E, row two. Yeah, top, top right hand. Two. Okay, got it, I got it, okay. So that's the total increase, and the city's share of that is the 1,000,000. So again, that's at 76 and a half, 24. Okay. So, Ms. Montano, correct? So you said the first decision or direction you need uh, today or, or soon 
is on, on, on these proposed increases. Is that correct? That's what, we, what I asked about. Correct. So it's approving um, the increase. If the city's budget cannot sustain that it percent of an increase, then to bring the increase down, that's when we would need to be looking at making the changes on, um, right, on page 15. Right, right. So any of those changes where it has, so just looking at the most significant change would be um, the last item on the list. Um, it would reduce the 9.9 percent .9 increase by 4.9 okay. percent. So it would reduce that ex that 1. Point, almost 9 million increase by 706 thousand dollars. Okay, so it would take it down from 9.9 .9 to 4.9. It would take by would four by four five. By four, yes. Okay, so it takes it down to essentially a five percent. So, but again, confirm with Ms. McCoy that right now the, the proposed budget, or the recommended budget, has the approximate 1.5? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Harris, yes, that is correct. The 1.5 million is reflected as the city's share. Right. Okay. Okay. I just wanted confirmation on that. And so, uh, if we want to look seriously about, uh, again, any of the items on page 15, particularly the, 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 the last one, the most significant one, is that something that that we can do now? Is it, or is it, are there constraints in union contracts? Uh, kind of what, I'm looking for some direction here. What can we do, if anything? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Harris, um, as Aon consultants have identified for the AFSCME um, and non-union plan, we can go ahead and make those changes. There are some constraints within our collective bargaining agreements right now for police and fire. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, I'm curious, um, so does Aon, do you handle claims management, management for us? Is that something you do or is, how are claims handled? Or do we do that internally? So, Councilman Harris, that's what Cigna does for you. You have hired Cigna um, to administer your plan and pay your claims. So, when an employee goes and accesses care, the claim is filed with Cigna. They will process it through their system to make sure that it is a covered procedure. They apply benefits to it and then pay the claim. And then ultimately, they bill back um, to the, the funds back to the city. And does Cigna, uh, what do they have to say about the, the and this is page four, um, the significant uh, increase for high cost claimants gone from 1.3 to 2.2. Do they offer an opinion why that has happened? I mean, they're doing the claims management. They should, they should have an opinion on that at least. Right, yes, and Mr. Chair, Councilor Harris, the high cost claimants are largely random extent non-competitive costs. Th these are your end-stage renal disease, the kidney failure, the cancer. Um, really, Cigna's, Cigna's efforts are focused around the controllable costs to claim. So again, uh, some of this is bad luck. Some of it is just medical trends that six to ten a year, you're going to end up with more and more high-cost and in general, do our, the demographic of our of our employees is? Do we look at that? In, I mean, you've looked at different benchmarks. I mean, are we older than a benchmark? Are we younger than a benchmark? Where does I would think an older uh, demographic would have higher cost claims. Absol absolutely, and Councilor Harris, your demographics are similar to other mu municipalities across the state. Okay, who are right. typically older. Older and wiser, I think, is the word you're looking for. Absolutely. That's, That's the word I could. <laughs> Being the oldest member of the council, I, I'm going to give myself a little latitude here. I'm going to pass, and I probably have some other questions, but I'm moving Council on down. 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 Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a, a 
really well put together report. It's really very understandable. Thank you. Um, what's, what's the area that we have the highest number of claims? Um, Professor Dallas, as just in pure numbers, like a number of claims? Not yeah. dollar amounts, just number of claims. Yeah. G generally, it's, it's going to be your office visits. Office visits? Office visits, lab, and that's Okay, is there any is there any one um, area of claim, um, for example, is it uh, you know influenza, um, neuromuscular, orthopedic? Yes, yeah. uh, Councilor Lindell, it is uh, musculoskeletal. And the treatment on that, what's the claim, what are the claims like on that? Councilor Lindell, they vary from knee and hip replacements to massage to other physical therapy treatments. So, so the range from surgeries to massage. Um, does massa is massage a sizable amount of claim? Other employer groups, yes. Could you give us a breakdown on that? Council Adel, yes, we can. Thank you. Would you make sure that that gets sent to the entire council? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> back on uh, page three. Um, right below the util utilization is the City of Santa Fe funding level. Um, can you explain what that is? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Rivera, you're referring to the two blue rows over the page? Uh, the first blue row of those two. The, the funding level, that, that is the total funding set aside for that fiscal year. So it includes both the cities the funding and the employees. All right, so it had been pretty consistent until this last fiscal year. Do we know why that is? Uh, Councilor Rivera, if you're looking at column A, that's not a complete fiscal year. That only goes through February. So that's why it's short of the, or a little less than 20 million that it's been the prior four years. All right, so we anticipate that probably being a little more to the consistent 19 that we've seen. Rivera, that's correct. The funding was not changed for this fiscal year. So assuming no drastic swings in enrollment, it should be in that ballpark. So then the total claims then and fixed costs, uh, I assume, are only till February as well? Council Rivera, that's correct. That's $13.5 million. So if that stays uh, fairly lower than expected, that deficit could be a surplus? Chair Councilor Rivera, we estimated coming into this fiscal year that it would run about a $600,000 deficit. Again, that's based on a recommended 3.5% increase to funding, which is not implemented and would be pulled from the health fund. So I would estimate at this point it's probably going to end up right around that level. Around 600? It is currently or a little bit better. Okay. You've had quite a few high-cost high claimants in the first eight months of the year, which some of which are resolved. Some have hit that $250,000 stop-loss level. So the city is not responsible for any amounts above that going forward. All right, and the surplus deficit has um, really jumped around from, from year to year. So you're anticipating that from, I guess, fiscal year 16 – or 17, 18, continuing forward, it's going to remain a deficit? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Rivera, yes. Health care cost claims are unpredictable, as you can see from the surpluses and deficits. But what you can see in that second to last row from the bottom, you can see that the increases in total costs have been fairly steady for the 
the last four years hovering at around 6% on average, which are in line with both local and national healthcare cost trends. So assuming that holds forward, that's more of a linear straight line look at it than looking at how it jumps from year to year. So that's the basis of the recommended increase is that, that, that the healthcare cost side of the inequality will continue to rise at a five or 6% level. We've been fortunate in the last four years in that we were in a significant surplus position in 14, 15, and 15, 16, and that we, we did not have to increase funding for a few years. But again, it's not increasing funding, but seeing those healthcare costs increase by 5% or so a year, that's, that's kind of caught up to the funding piece at this point. And I know this is a tough thing to try to probably answer, but if we accept or we, this governing body does a $1.5 million increase as recommended that we would be uh, not in the deficit or more in the surplus for the next two years, three years? Mr. Chair, Councilor Rivera, the, going back to the couple of pages where I, where I go through the methodology, there is no margin in that 9.9% .9 increase. It is our best estimate of the cost for the next fiscal year. It doesn't really, it doesn't have a margin in there, so it should not create a surplus or a deficit in a perfect world. It would, the funding would equal the expenses. But again, with a variation in expenses, it could go either way. It's basically a 50-50 chance that there will be a surplus or a deficit. And again, I would, uh, you know, remind everyone that I think uh, the benefits that the city has are some of the, probably the best in the state and really one of the reasons that keeps many employees here. Um, it's a great attractor for coming to the city of Santa Fe is the great benefits that we have. So uh, I would hope that we would uh, take the recommendation um, of the consultants and uh, it, it has been budgeted for is what I heard you tell Councilor Harris. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, yes, that is correct. It is budget, the 1.5 million increase is budgeted in FY20. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I was just curious if you all tracked or had a understanding of when the wellness program got implemented and what year that was and how that affected claimants, if there was a way to analyze that, that, that it actually went down because we had a proactive way to deal with health and wellness. And I can't remember what year that was. It was before my time, I think, when you all implemented the wellness program. Do you remember? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Villarreal, I believe um, the wellness coordinator who uh, just retired a couple months ago was here for the last 10 years. So it's been about 10 years. So was there ever, did you all see an, or have an analysis on that, that that was something that was helpful for the city as it related to our claims and um, looking more proactively at health? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Villarreal, there's generally a lag time between the implementation of a wellness pro program and results. And it's also a program for which measuring success or failure of such a program is very difficult. You have turnover in employees, but in, in general, wellness programs do help to contain healthcare costs. But again, the, the return on that is difficult to measure. Bern, did you have any insight on that? Mr. Chairman, Councilor Villarreal, I think if you look at the numbers again, it's just going to depend on the year, what kind of claims we see. If we see a couple of high claims in that year, um, definitely I think wellness programs are, are helpful and um, they start transforming um, behavior, lifestyle behaviors. And so we will continue with that in hopes to see some added value to our bottom line numbers with that. And we have um, also included some additional um, opportunities for employees like healthy cooking classes and things of, of that nature. Great, thank you. Uh, on that point, 
Councilor? Can I tag on? <laughs> Uh, and, and are we evaluating our wellness program against the kinds of claims that we're getting to make sure that what we're offering um, is, you know, helping to contain those costs, I guess is the question? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Romero Worth, we were not evaluating the actual programming, but we are now as we um, engage in new um, opportunities for employees. So that will be hand in hand with um, the claims that we see and a full circle of those opportunities we offer to our employees. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Councilor Vera, I also have oh, pardon on that point or another topic. Okay. Let me just ask a few more. Um, so, Bern, was there a did you all have these considerations for the benefit changes? Um, did you have an opinion about that, about making adjustments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Villarreal, are you speaking about the increases alone? Yeah, I think it's more the, the changes in the benefits where the co-pays go up and the, in, in regard to the premium, the deductibles increased or actually you have a deductible. So I'm just curious if there was um, kind of a staff perspective on it. Yeah, yes, we did look at this and I think um, one of the reasons why we asked Dan to also um, provide some be benchmark data is to let us know how we compare to other organizations as well. But we did look at this and in an effort to try to um, manage our, our claims costs, um, we, we do think that some of these changes would be necessary, um, either now or in the near future. Okay. And this was just an example for premium. You all were making suggestions on all three plans and making adjustments. I was looking at your last recommendation. Where is it? The next steps. Um, I don't know. Was that all three that you, all three plans you were talking about adjustments, even though you just showed us premium, no. or was it just premium? No. Because ninety-five percent of our employees are on that. Yeah, M Mr. Chairman, Councilor Villarreal, that is only on the premium plan. Again, there are fewer than a hundred employees on the other two plans. Okay. So those would only be implemented on the premium plan. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll yield the floor for now. Thank you. Councilor Hill Coppler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, uh, you indicated that the $1.5 million was budgeted. So do, does that include any of the excise tax issue that was brought up? Or have, have you all made a – are you planning to make a recommendation on that? Um, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Vigil Coppler, the excise tax will, will not kick in until at least 2022, so that is not included in any of the budget considerations for this year. However, that is why we presented some of these potential benefit changes is to help mitigate that in the future. Okay, so is that planned for in, in may, maybe even in any discussions? I, this is the first I've heard of it, so I'm wondering if you all, you probably have heard of it, so. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Vigil Coppler, uh, yes, uh, we have heard of this and we wanted to um, begin the discussions in the event that it does get um, um, enacted in 2022. That way we're prepared and, you know, as we continue with our quarterly uh, meetings with Aon, we will continue to evaluate this and bring any updates to the full council as they arise. All right. And I also had a question about um, the wellness program and the staff person that um, was budgeted for that. Is that a budgetary item you're going to continue in the wellness program and is that a is that charged off to, to the benefit costs, or is it just a regular general fund item? Councilor Vigil Coppler, uh, yes, that is a budgeted position, and we are working on um, the recruitment for that. We're going to modify it a little bit. Um, it will continue to be a wellness position. 
um, but it'll have more direct uh, correlation with our benefits claim, claims costs. Um, that is a position that is funded through the benefits fund. Okay, and on the, the question Councillor Lindell asked about massages, are those just uh, voluntary massages or are they doctor ordered? Councillor Vihil Kopler, um, I, I don't know when the plan was changed, I believe maybe the last couple years, but um, as it stands today, they, you didn't have to have a, an order from a doctor. Um, so it is by doctor's orders. Um, but there is a lot of visits that are contained within our policy right now, within our plan. So if I can add to that, Chairman and Councillor Vigil Koffler, um, when uh, the City of Santa Fe moved from United Healthcare administering your health plan to Cigna, um, one of the changes was made that was made at that time was requiring medical necessity for that benefit provision. So prior to Cigna, Yes, an employee could go get a massage and it would be covered by the health plan if it was done at um, a direct, uh, at a facility. When we put Cigna in to help control this cost and just put some barriers around it, um, they did require medical necessity. So an employee would have to go to their primary care physician or to a specialist and have the doctor order that massage therapy would be re, um, a viable form of physical therapy to help treat their condition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Ives. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this may be a question more for staff. A number of years ago, the governing body had, uh, in connection with the health plan, established a $5 million reserve um, I must admit I haven't seen any of that reflected in here, so wondering uh, where that's at and uh, whether or not this budget includes maintenance of that as directed by the governing body. Yes. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Ives, um, there is no formal policy on a reserve fund for our health fund, but the recommendation um, in my research has been about five million. Um, you know, that standard could vary and Aon can definitely weigh, on, weigh in. Um, I did do some calculations. Um, currently our, our fund balance is at seven million, um, but our average monthly claims over the course of this last year have been uh, about 1.6 million and our admin fees about 128,000 for a total of a little over 1.7 million a month. So, um, you know, my recommendation in the event that we have um, a budget shortfall or an economic downturn would be to have, you know, anywhere from 35 to 40 percent uh, reserve. Um, additionally, last year, I think it was mentioned earlier, um, because the dental fund balance uh, was in the red for several years and the um, the health fund balance, there was a, um, a resolution that moved about 900 and, I'm sorry, uh, where's that number? Approximately 800,000 um, from the reserve fund to the fund balances to make up that difference last, last fiscal year. Um, and you say there is no established policy on that? That's correct. I, um, there's no formal policy on the reserve policy for the m medical fund. I was pretty sure we had voted on that, but we can look into that. But so that just to keep that as a placeholder, that may actually be the policy. So, uh, Councilor Lindell, did you have a? Are you finished, Councilor Ives? I'm sorry. Yeah. Councilor Lindell. The chair. So do we need to vote on this today or do we have some more time to bring this forward to, for example, uh, into committee so that we can have some further discussions on this? Uh, that was going to be my question also. Is what is the, what are you recommending? Mr. Chairman, uh, Councillor Lindell, I think, um, yeah, yeah, we can have some more time throughout this process. We do need to wrap up the um, 
the agreement with Cigna because that contract expires June 30th, so the sooner we can get a decision, the better, so we can start our open enrollment for employees. You mean a decision on Cigna, but on the premium increases, we have time. The premium increases, but the open enrollment will um, include the premium increases, so we need that decision before we start our open enrollment. By when do we need the decision? Uh, we just had the discussion with Don. I don't know if you can give a definite date. Uh, Chairman and uh, Councillor Abeza, we um, normally open enrollment for employees to come in and make their decisions to continue their health care, change plans, etc. cetera, um, occurs in June. And uh, we, in order to have everything ready within the system and the tools that they utilize to make their open enrollment changes, we would need to have that information. We're going to be building that system in the month of May. Um, we, we would probably need to have the final decision on what the contributions are going to be for employees and employer um, by the middle of May to be able to finalize that in time for, uh, to roll out to the employees. Do we have to increase premiums this fiscal year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that would be a decision of the council, and um, if premiums are not increased, then we need to talk about how uh, the fund balance would, would be made whole, basically. So it's not proposed in the budget, or it is? Okay. Council Mr. Rebecca. Chairman, just to clarify, the alternative, if we did not uh, see this $1.5 million dollar increase for the city would be to dip into reserves as has been done in prior years. So uh, that's why we will follow up with the reserve policy that Councillor Ives brought up um, to forecast how long we could continue uh, without uh, compromising the reserve levels. Councillor Rivera. Ms. McCoy, this is uh, part of the city's budget, right? So it has to be submitted as part of the balance to the state or that we're, we have a balanced budget? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, yes, that is correct. And really that as the overall process wouldn't happen until the end of May, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, uh, we have scheduled a vote, I believe. Um, the earliest that we could vote in council would be in early May on the budget. But, and the latest that we could vote would be your last council meeting in May. And what was your an anticipated date to actually vote on the overall budget? I, uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, I believe it was May 8th. Yes, Wednesday, May 8th. Okay. I don't know if that would give it time to go through the committee process or if it would just be part of this budget process that then would be heard at council. I, is that how you anticipate it going? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, yes, that's what we would recommend, that um, this body, the Finance Committee, make any determinations with their vote, and then this be heard directly at Council subsequent to the vote. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I mean, this is the committee process right now, right here. It's just a little um, confusing because we're all here. So... <laughs> So, I, yeah, yeah, we all, we all, we all are here. Um, so I just, you know, I, I think if there's more that we want to talk about, we do have some scheduled time um, at the end of these two weeks where we could tack on more information if that were required, correct? Would the committee like to do that then? Councilor Harris, what are your thoughts? Well, I, my thoughts are that um, I, I personally, I, I, I think we should acknowledge and do the premium increase. Uh, we, we avoided it last year and perhaps even the year before. I can't remember. Three years we've done it. Uh, you, know, I, you know, examining our reserve policy I think is important. I'm pleased to hear that if we think it was $5 million, that we're really at about $7 million right now. So in practice, we've adhered to that. Uh, and furthermore, I think that although I don't believe we need to do it now, I think there needs to be a discussion about our plan. And really, as we try to, try to strike a balance on 
on salaries and wages in terms of class and comp and get us up to a, a point where we need to be, look at the, look at the whole package. Uh, but for the, for the time being, I think, and again, I, it's, hard, it's hard to determine exactly how much is looking at this would mean on a, say, a monthly basis. I know some of them were like $7.77 for a single. So it seems like their approximate 24% increase to the employees should be manageable, I believe. Uh, particularly manageable under, uh, it's characterized, and I, I looking at the chart, as a generous plan. So I think we should go ahead and accept the premium increase as part of our, our budget. But that's, and I would, I would move to do so. Okay. We have a motion, is there a second? Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? I, I guess I would just add that um, I think the thing that we do need to look at is this excise tax issue. And, and that is certainly a subject uh, uh, for the Finance Committee and, and the committee process uh, in the coming months um, is, is to really take a deep dive into what that means and how, how we plan for that um, in a way that's prudent for everybody. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, Councilor Rivera, did you wanna add anything under discussion? Okay, then we're gonna call for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Okay, so that is gonna bring us to our department reviews. And our first department to review is gonna be the mayor and council. Who will be presenting Manager Lipsenberg. The mayor. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not certain who is presenting that in the absence of the mayor, but I will give you that answer shortly. Okay, should we move on to the city manager then? Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I'm, I'm good with that, if you're good with it. Okay, Councilor Rivera, we're going to move on to the city manager, as you suggest, since the mayor's not here. Okay, so uh, the city manager's budget. Manager Litzenberg. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll run through uh, the packets that you all have in your, um, in your binders. Um, and then I'll open up for any questions that you all might have. Uh, in terms of the budget highlights, I think the city manager's budget this year is going to be very simple. Uh, for fiscal year 20, the recommended budget for the city manager's office, it's within the general government department. It will decrease 388.9 thousand. That's a 32% decrease from the fiscal year 19 budget. Um, that's for a few reasons. One is that we've separated out emergency management uh, and we'll do that budget as well shortly, another simple budget with a big impact, however. Um, we have moved the public defender position and the Westlaw services contract that go with that to community services. Uh, and then of course we have uh, a small amount of contract funds that were dedicated towards internal audit. We've moved it into a, the internal audit division. Uh, as we did this year, the internal audit will be outsourced. We'll talk about that again um, later in the day tomorrow, um, but it's no longer contained within the city manager's budget. Uh, additionally, the fiscal year 20 recommended budget uh, includes half of a $70,000 um, that's partnering up 35000 in the city manager's bu budget, 35000 from the uh, Office of Emergency Management to implement software uh, for airfield inspections and the EOC. Um, with that budget, uh, the goals, fiscal, fiscal year 20 goals for the city manager's office are to continue to work with you all as the governing body to implement your policy decisions, to work with members of the governing body to address concerns in your districts and of course citywide. Um, that's, that's part of the job. The other part of the job is um, looking at the rest of the organization, coordinating the department directors and providing guidance on the implementation of the mandates that you all have provided and to work closely with the departments to provide services to our constituents. 
Uh, we'll also continue to work with the departments to provide a safe and respectful workplace for the employees. It's one of my big pushes for this year and for the years that I work here. Um, I'll skip over the multimedia goals um, shortly. We'll come back to those when Joe, I don't see Joe right now, but we'll bring him out. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of what I did with this year's budget and the city manager's office coming down, come on down, Joe. Uh, helped coordinate the transition to a strong mayor, which has been a, uh, a good complex, but exercise in coordination um, while working with you all to implement your policy decisions and address your concerns. Of course, we conduct, conducted a search for um, the department directors, um, some of which were elevated from within their departments, some of which stayed in their positions, and some of which, some of whom were brought from elsewhere, uh, and then uh, helped them coordinate delivery of the services. Um, and we helped the entire governing body and our staff as a whole initiate some strategic planning, uh, restructure the management of ongoing citywide initiatives, and we've begun the restructure, as you'll see with a few proposals um, in this budget of citywide organization to better deliver services. Uh, but within the city manager's budget is multimedia. So Joe, you wanna talk for a couple minutes about, or would you like me to continue doing it? Right, Jess, I'll continue doing it. So. Fiscal year goals for multimedia, which is within this budget, uh, to switch the government channel to high definition. Um, they have completed upgrades and they're waiting for legal to approve an agreement with Comcast. Produce more content for government channel and increase presence on social media. In terms of their accomplishments from fiscal year 19, they completed phase two of the upgrade of this chambers, the AV here and the high definition upgrade. Uh, they successfully produced remote city council meetings um, at many locations in the city, which was uh, one of the mayor's initiatives. We're glad we were able to support it. Um, we produced 22 city council meetings, 30 episodes of City Hall Live, 15 PSAs, 25 webcast episodes, and a whole lot of special projects and videos. A number of the PSAs he did was pick up the poop. It's the first time I've said poop in a council meeting. Hope not to do it again, to tell you the truth. Speeding potholes and water conservation. Support city staff and uh, public with Chambers AV equipment and assisted with the city's social media accounts, Facebook and YouTube. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. It is a pretty simple budget. It's pretty small based upon what we've moved out of it, but I can answer any questions you all might have. So in our packet, the next pages are the detail. And I see to the far right an explanation if there's a, a major change, it looks like, one way or another. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. This is the format that we are proceeding with this year. OpenGov is still available if you wish to look in the IT system, but we are will be providing this detail with the explanations that you referenced for each department for your ease of reference. Okay. Um, I, I'll start with a question or a concern, I guess, is the high definition upgrades, I remember Councilor Lindell asked specifically about that last year during budget hearings, and we were told that we were negotiating with Comcast that front. So we've been negotiating for about a year. So if we can check with legal and pick those negotiations up, I think that would be, that would be appreciated. Uh, Mr. Chair, understood. We'll check with legal and pick it up. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Romero Worth. So somewhere in here, when, when I had the this copy of the budget, the, the bound copy, um, there was 600,000, I think, um, for upgrades of City Hall. Is that, did I see that right? And is that, is, is there, is that coming later? Or is, is the stuff in here part of that 600,000? Or, or how, how does that work? Uh, Chairman, Councillor Romero Worth, uh, that is in the capital budget. Okay. And so if you go into the budget book and look in the capital budget, there's 600,000 for City and, Hall. And that's different than anything that's being talked about here. Excuse me? That's different than what's being talked about here in this, in this uh, segment of the budget. That is correct. And, okay. and the 600,000 is part of the 2018 GRT bond. Ah, okay. Uh, and then one other question, Mr. Chair. Um, have we ever thought about uh, uh, providing, I don't know what the right word is, um, uh, access to our committee meetings, that just the, count, the, the major council meetings like finance, um, uh, utilities, and public works 
the way we do the council meetings to, to televising them or providing them uh, via audio feed of some sort? Mr. Chair, Councilor Meadowworth, um, I haven't been part of that discussion. Joe, I don't know if you have an estimate of what that would cost. It's certainly something we can consider in the future if you all are interested in us um, looking into it. I, I think it's something that, um, you know, more and more uh, governing bodies are uh, trying to provide ways to be more accessible. And I don't know what the cost on that is, but it is something that I think we ought to be cognizant of. Just off the top of your head, um, what what committees would you want? Would you want like finance, the main ones, public works, finance? Just the, just the council committees, the the the, the three big ones: uh, finance, utilities, public works. Okay, we can we can look into that definitely. Councillor Harris, just yeah, as Joe, uh, kind of as a follow up question to Councillor Romero Worth. Yes, sir. Do you have any sense of how many people watch our council meetings? Uh, yeah, because well, I mean, I know on YouTube we have a better sense, and just if you have something controversial, it's going to be they're going to have a high audience. If there's nothing going on, you're not going to have a very big audience. So it's just a matter of what the topics are. Okay, but give us some numbers. Uh, some numbers? Yeah. What do you think? How many people are watching on a on a normal <laughs> Wednesday? Right now, evening? but hold on. Let me let me. Uh, let me go to our channel real quick. Okay, no, wait. I didn't realize this was being live cast. Yes. Oh. That's yes. We, we, we've done it, I think, the last... All right. Hi, everybody. Years or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's news. Yeah. How do I look? <laughs> In that case... You should have worn a tie. Uh, the, last council meeting, the last council meeting we had... Four. Chocolate. The previous council meeting we had 80... The last one we had was 54. Uh, the one before that, there was 80. Um, the one that was at the south side, 176. Good. Uh, 84, previous to that one. The, oh, 482 for the February 13th one. 482 views. Um, so, I mean, the biggest one was when we, the last one we had was at the rodeo grounds. I think it got to like, uh, it was in the thousands. On, on that point, can, yes. I mean, do you see, can you tell the difference between who watches later and who watches in, in real time? Uh, uh, I can look that up. I'm sure on YouTube would tell us that. And at the rodeo grounds, did they, in fact, stay and watch till 3 a.m. when we were? Uh, I don't think so. It kind of dropped <laughs> but after 2.30. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, but I, I know that there was. I know. I tried to forget that session. Yeah. Okay, enough. <laughs> thank, thank you, Joe. Yeah, no problem. Anything else, Councillor Harris? Councillor Rivera. Uh, Joe, since you're still up there, um, just a question about nope. how much um, social media stuff do you know, do now? Because I thought uh, constituent services was handling some of that. So, so my thing is, I'll produce the videos. And then I'll and then I'll I'll, I'll put them up on Facebook, um, you know. If they ask, I, I I have no problem doing that. It's real easy for me to do something like that, and I, I do that also for uh, a side gig that I have outside of the city. So I'm used to posting. I'm pretty. I feel very comfortable with social media. So, Mr. City Manager, how does the increased presence in social media work with Joe? And I guess who's doing it now? Mr. Chair, Councillor, I think this goes into what the mayor and I both spoke about in terms of collaboration, things that we're trying to take out of silos. Social media is a way that we're communicating with our constituents across the board, and I think you're going to see increases in social media presence through pretty much every way we do it. Joe does that, of course, Constituent Services does that, our Public Information Office does it, and we actually have social media amongst a lot of the departments as well. So it's, it's just one way that we're interacting with our constituents more and more. And just can I bring up, Councillor, um, that uh, Matt Ross did a lot of the social media before he left, so he kept that really, t he did that side of it, where I did more of the production side and, and shows and everything, but the, since he left, he said, you know, what the heck, I can, I can jump in on that also. I know, Mr. City Manager, breaking down silos is, is important, I do agree with that, but we were... Uh, under in in the process of trying to 
Let me give you an example. So the city attorney's office had had attorneys in different locations and budgeting out of different different places and trying to figure out, for example, like how much water was contributing to the city attorney's office for services or, or were they contributing and um, so here we're going to take basically social media and kind of divide it into different areas. How are we going to keep track of the funding part of it? Well, I, I can, Councillor Chair and Councillor, I don't I don't necessarily think the funding part of it is is a huge concern here. Joe's doing the work that he's doing, whether it's on social media, whether he's producing videos that are going to be on his channel. I think the the important part for me in breaking down the silos is that more information is coming out of every department across the city and getting out to our constituents and that more information is coming from the constituents back in for us to respond to. So I don't, for instance, um, think you should see a social media line item in Joe's budget. It's more about what he's producing for social media. The police office or the police department has their own social media department and they have a Facebook page and some other things. Would all those be coordinated through one office or they going to stay separate? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor, we're trying to um, get the content of those coordinated through a single office, although there's an administrator for each one. We're trying to make sure that we understand what's being produced, and we're trying to link them all together through however you link them. <laughs> Again, not much with social media, hashtagging and whatnot, um, so that it's all one single city product that's going out to the constituents. Okay. Um, on page two, right after the tab for the city manager, um, you have seventy thousand and thirty-five thousand. Um, is is that remaining in your budget, or is it going to be included in the emergency managers and the airport of, or the airports budget? Is that what those are for? Because you're separating the departments out, right? So why wouldn't those departments have those? Mr. Chair, Councilor, um, as Mary looks at it, perhaps she can give us the technical reason why it's split between two. The, the total cost for that is seventy thousand. Thirty-five thousand is built into the emergency management budget. Thirty-five thousand is coming out of the city manager budget. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rivera, this was an oversight on our part. We did not move the thirty-five thousand uh, dollars for contribution for the emergency management portion of the $70,000 system into the emergency management operating budget when we split the two, um, when we split emergency management out of uh, the city manager's office. Okay. Um, my last question, Mr. Chair, is uh, the public defender, um, had, had that not been part of the city attorney's department or office before? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilor, um, the public defender can't be part of the city attorney's office. It needs to be separate. So prior, prior to um, me and prior to this movement, it was um, being overseen by the deputy city manager position, and we've moved it into community services. Okay. Does that, and for everyone involved, that makes the most sense to put it in community services? Mr. Chair, Councilor, we weren't certain when we did it if it would make the most sense. Our community services director has since said it makes total sense. Why not in the court budget? Or is it not allowed to be in the court budget? Mr. Chair, Councilor, I would assume it wouldn't be appropriate in the court budget. Okay. Uh, that's all I had, Mr. Chair. Councilor Lindell, did you have any questions? All right, uh, Mayor, I don't think I called on you in quite some time. Do you have any questions? No, but thank you. Councillor Ives, Councillor Villarreal. I, I just had a clarification on the org chart. So um, I was remembering, let's see. So public defenders out, asset development is no longer underneath general. So it's moved to? Mr. Chair, Councilor, it's being moved to economic development. Okay. And we'll see that in the economic development details. I didn't see it in the org chart, but. Uh, Councilor, that's okay. correct. And as Ms. McCoy noted, that is still within general government, but it'll be under economic development. Still under general, the budget part, the way we, we pay um, employees. Um, 
Mr. Chair, Councilor, correct. Right now we're looking at general government as a whole. City manager's office is just one component of the, of the general government as a whole. Okay. And then the PIO will be under which uh, department? Or is that Mr. folded Chair, in Councilor, under? I believe it's shown in constituent council services. Okay. So I think what would it be helpful, and maybe we did this last year, but there's details of how, of what how many employees are in each of the different divisions. And so it, you don't really see that. So in this case, if you're looking at the general government, you have all your, um, the divisions, but it doesn't say what what's under constituent services. So that's PIO and also multimedia, correct? Or is multimedia separate in its own? Uh, Council right now, there's split, yeah. There's split? I, I believe the you just asked about the PIO position. Yeah. I believe the PIO position shows in the constituent council services budget, whereas the um, the multimedia position is one we just considered in the city manager's office. Okay, so would we have to put that on the org chart as a separate entity or a separate person? So I guess I'm just it's really confusing for me to know who's who falls under what, like PIO, who's the direct supervisor. And in addition, once we get there, but even if you look at the mayor's office, there's a few people under that office. It's not just the mayor. So there's the chief of staff. And so I think it would be helpful to understand who makes up each of those areas or how many staff people, because we, we had that in the last year, in last year's budget, we had a better understanding of staff numbers in the actual document, maybe not so much in the org chart, but it would help me to understand who's under what, if they have a s separate title, if they're not, say, like a constituent services person, that they would be whoever, PIO or. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Villarreal, uh, the org charts that are provided in the budget book are at the division level, so we wouldn't see that um, same level of detail uh, that you are requesting, but we are more than happy to provide that level of detail. I think just knowing how many staff are in it, each division would be helpful. Of course. So, uh, then, on that point, sorry, I keep piggybacking. <laughs> I know you love The voice from the wilderness way over here. <laughs> uh, are you looking for FTEs or are you looking for titles or both? Because I think it's usually reflected as FTEs, right? It depends. Some yeah. would need FTEs and others I think would be helpful to have the title because they're kind of in their own entity, like a PIO or in the multimedia director. What's your title? <laughs> Manager, okay. Make I'll make you a director. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Councillor Villarreal, Councillor Romero-Worth, we are happy to provide the, the detailed breakdown. That's what we used as a basis for building the budget, the, the personnel and benefits portion of the budget. So we have that readily available. That would be helpful. And then just semantics. I always wonder, when we talk about governing body, I thought that was all of us, including the mayor. Okay, so in the org chart, it would be mayor and then um, just change governing body to council. Don't you think? It's semantics, but I just still think it doesn't, we don't have our own budget, we don't have our own staff, so it'd be helpful to just have a breakdown. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Neil Coughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to get back to the social media issue, and that is, um, I don't, I don't see any problem with social media duties being apportioned in various departments who have the enthusiasm for presenting what they do and the like, because I believe they know more about their departments and what's going on. And I think that's good PR for the city. So far, what I've seen um, on Facebook, for example, um, the fire department, the police department, and then others. And so I, I don't see that as an issue. What I don't understand is who is doing this, what positions are doing this. And I, I often see responses, you know, down into the in deep in posts, and then there's some city responses to some of the comments and I and I wonder about that because well maybe I would have answered it differently or it doesn't matter it's not anything I've seen that's inappropriate 
It's just I wonder, who is this speaking on behalf of this city? I think that's important to know. Um, because if I have something I'd like to contribute or add to, there's no one I can direct it to. So, and I wonder what, what or if we have a social media policy in place. When you get out there into the land of social media, there are certain uh, things you have to keep in mind before you do something or say something on behalf of an organization. And many organizations I belong to or have belonged to have social media policies. I don't know if we have one. Do you know? Mr. Chair, Counselor, to answer the first part of that, I'd be happy to give you um, a, a list of who we're having answer on our behalf in each one of those sites so that you're more aware of who is speaking on our behalf. That's something we can do. Regarding the latter, um, there are a couple departments that have social media policies. We've been working on a citywide social media policy that will apply towards everyone. And again, I'd be happy to share that with you as it develops. That would be good because um, it's really important. There's, there's a lot of parameters and boundaries that should be established before the city's represented in, in some way, and it's not exactly the best way. So uh, I, I, though, am a real proponent of it. Uh, and, and I think, uh, well, I, I think it's really important to know who is doing this on behalf of the city. Not that it's a problem, but it's, I think it's good. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask would be about um, budget policy for hiring. Um, I'm wondering how that works, because last budget season, we created the Constituent Services Department, for example, and we budgeted a finite amount of money for each position, identified the ranges and such, and the hires that we made went above that. And so I'm wondering, how does that work? Is that something um, that is allowed in all departments, or is it just in the city manager's office? going over budget for budgeted positions, especially new ones. Mr. Chairman, Councillor V. Hill Coppler, we uh, have a rigorous process to review, starting with HR and continuing on to the finance department, to review each budget. Obviously, HR checks for um, a HR policies, um, the, the ranges that you mentioned, and then budget, uh, we'll check to see if sufficient budget is available to fund, um, to pay for the positions at the rate that they will be filled at. So we're more than happy to, um, in answering your question specifically, provide that analysis for the positions that you are referencing. Well, I, I do know um, the details. I'm just wondering about policy. And, for example, if a position is budgeted at 40,000, um, how, how high, how, is there a, a rule that you can go 15% above that? Uh, what is it? And, and uh, especially when it's a finite amount of money that was approved by the governing body in terms of a budget document, I'm just wondering, and it's a recurring expense, so now it's in here for the next year and so on. I, I'm asking this question because it's a way to control costs. It's a way to control employee equity. It's a way to control for fairness across departments. So if, if one department is able to recruit and hire more than what is budgeted, then should another department be allowed to do that? And, and that's what I mean in terms of equity and fairness, and that is, if not controlled, then it creates inequity. And I, my concern in the city always has been to create equity, and then that affects employee morale and, and the whole thing. So. I know, I don't know, I know that you can't really tell me now, and I, I just want to bring it up because I think it's an issue, and I think it should be addressed sooner than later, and 
um, that we should have hiring policies in place that offer fairness and equity. Mr. Chairman, Councillor V. Hill Coppler, uh, as a budget policy in this budget before you, each vacant position is budgeted at the midpoint of the range. So when we, when staff is reviewing each position, uh, personnel action to fill each position, we first look at the budget so that the midpoint of the range could be $15 an hour. We like to give department directors the flexibility to bring in candidates with more experience, maybe at um, somewhere between the midpoint and the, the maximum of the range. That being said, we do look, we do require a fiscal impact analysis for each personnel action that will deviate from the budgeted amount. And in that case, departments have to indicate, to show us that they are not using vacancy savings to fund the difference in the position, but instead that they are using salary savings to fund the difference in the position. Does, and that also includes an estimate and analysis of recurring costs into the next fiscal year and how they're going to keep. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Vahil Coppler, Coppler, absolutely. We do, we, um, the fiscal impact analysis indicates the annualized cost because that is important to us, as you indicated before, to, uh, to not have our personnel costs growing exponentially based on these increases that come through. That's why the fiscal impact analysis does include the annualized costs as well as the cost of benefits. Okay, well, I think you get my drift, and I, I uh, certainly have seen this in the city manager's budget. So there you go. The next item I, I quickly want to ask for is I, we have a lot of good detail in here, and I've yet, I, I've yet to see a salary chart that has the ranges listed, including the rates of pay for each salary range. And when positions are advertised, it only has a salary range number or, or letter. And without knowing those or having a salary chart of, available, I, I, I can't surmise what the pay is for a position. So, um, and when we analyze the budget and we have these new positions, it would be good to know what the rates of pay are so you can put everything in context. And the other last thing I would like to see, and I don't know, maybe it's in here, but is an analysis of how many FTEs we have by category, exempt, classified, temporary, term, part-time and full-time included in all of those, and compared to this year, and then what next year? And just a simple analysis presented in that fashion. Because when you see the numbers and, and number of employees in various categories from one to the next, it really is eye-opening. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Vihlacopler, we have all of that information. I'm so glad that you asked. We are more than happy to present that with each of the departments. I think it's very important that we are keeping um, track of the changes from year to year in the categories as you expressed. Additionally, I wanted to point out uh, in the budget document there were references to creating positions and adding positions. I think that might be what you are referencing. Uh, for the majority of the positions, the classified positions that uh, we are, that we referenced in the budget book, we are actually reclassifying positions that have been vacant for multiple months, sometimes years that departments are not able to fill or um, those positions are no longer uh, relevant or, or um, needed at the city. So I think it has uh, been an, a great experience to work with the department directors throughout this process to understand that you know, where we can fill positions, um, you know, they are filling them at the appropriate uh, salaries that have been budgeted and additionally where we cannot fill positions or where those positions are no longer needed because of efficiencies and technology or otherwise, we are then reclassifying those positions to other purposes that are currently needed in the throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there a motion regarding the city manager's budget? Councilor Rivera. Ask another question on that point. Uh, Ms. McCoy, the fiscal impact analysis, are those available for review? 
Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivetta, absolutely everything we do is a public record. All right, I'll uh, be in contact with you about a, a couple that I, I would like to review, but they'll, they'll show the details of, um, let's say somebody that has 10 years experience, uh, 10 years of experience versus somebody that may have a master's degree, it'll explain the difference in why one was paid so much more than the other. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivetta, no, that is not the purpose of the fiscal impact analysis. The fiscal impact analysis gives us the true cost of the position uh, of the person uh, that they are hiring into the position. So if that rate is $15 an hour and they are going to be brought in with uh, full employee plus uh, family benefits, that impact is different than an employee that will not be taking benefits. And so we really want to understand the true cost. Well, then what do we have that determines what I just said? The difference in pay for the same job duties, but just differences in maybe education and years of experience. Mr. Chairman, uh, Councillor Rivera, I will defer to the HR Director, Bernadette Salazar. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rivetta, um, that process is vetted through the recruitment process. So when we get a packet for a new hire, um, a, a request from the department, HR evaluates that and ensures that we're in compliance with all the collective bargaining agreements, if it's a union position, or with the HR policies if it's a non-union position. And what determines the, the difference in pay between education and, and experience. Is there something, I mean, is there a formula? Is we don't currently have a formula. It's gonna be based on the needs of the department. Um, is that a highly difficult uh, position to uh, recruit and hire for? There's a variety of factors that go into that decision-making process. Who makes the final determination? Is it HR, is it budget, is it the department director? The department director makes the recommendation and it goes through a series of approvals to include HR, finance, and the city manager. All right. well, I think there's some inequities in that process and I think, um, I don't know if we need to develop some type of formula or something that, that develops some equity in, in how we do that, but thank you. Okay, is there a motion regarding the city manager's budget? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Okay, we'll go back to the mayor and council. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, sorry, if I may. So emergency management was not given its own spot on any of the two weeks agenda since it came out of the city manager's budget. We are prepared to present that as the second half of city manager's budget. It is in your book and you could review it if you um, feel so inclined. What, where? Emergency management. Oh, it's in the, it's towards the back of the binder? That's correct. The information is in your binder. It would have been the second half of the city manager's budget, but we have separated the two. It was just not given a spot in the two-week agenda. Okay, so let's take a look at that now. Chair, uh, members of the council. Um, the Office of Emergency Management, our mission is to create an environment of readiness for the whole community through a comprehensive program of prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and uh, disaster recovery. Um, the budget this fiscal year has kind of two main highlights. Um, the first that you'll notice if you look at the breakdown um, is that there is an overall decrease um, to our budget, but that is reflected because of primarily our grants um, every fiscal year we receive various grants from the New Mexico Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Some of them have um, a, one, a single fiscal year uh, term, others go a longer performance period. Um, so the decrease is reflecting the end of some of those grants. It doesn't mean that we're not pursuing application for next fiscal year. We just do not know what awards will be, so we're not budgeting um, budget for those grants for next fiscal year. Um, the second highlight is uh, what the city manager mentioned earlier is the uh, $35,000 that will be moved into our uh, operating budget um, for a piece of software that is going to be utilized by the Office of Emergency Management in our Emergency Operations Center. Um, it's kind of got four main functions. Uh, it's to primarily coordinate 
uh, and communicate between the emergency operations center and supporting departments and field responders um, to improve and increase real-time situational awareness, um, improve documentation, which is critical for uh, any declared disaster that we may be seeking state or federal reimbursement. Um, and it will be utilized during trainings, exercises, special events, um, and during actual emergency incidents um, throughout uh, the year. Um, the emergency, the Office of Emergency Management, uh, our goals, uh, we have four overarching goals. Uh, I'll read through those. The, the first one is uh, focused on planning efforts. Um, we're going to continue revising uh, existing or develop new plans to be maintained by our office. Uh, the two that we're primarily focusing on this year are our response plan, which ensures coordination among city departments in response to natural, technological, or man-made hazards. And the second is a mitigation plan, which we're just starting. Um, and this is a plan that currently exists, but we're in the revision process. It's required by FEMA uh, to be reviewed and revised every five years to be eligible for uh, federal mitigation funds. And this plan focuses to build a more resilient community through innovation, uh, innovative mitigation strategies. Um, we do continue to support other city departments with development of plans that they may have. Um, that are relevant to our office and continue to focus on uh, multi-year training and exercise planning efforts to ensure that we're uh, moving forward in a, a consolidated effort towards uh, improving our planning uh, efforts. Uh, with the completion of our new Emergency Operations Center, we're going to develop EOC Emergency Operations Center policies and procedures as well as implement this uh, the software tool. Um, Focused on training and exercise, we're going to continue to ensure that all departments within the city of Santa Fe have access to training and exercise support available through our office. Uh, we're going to optimize and enhance our EOC Emergency Operations Center capabilities through uh, a regular training and exercise program to make sure, make sure that we're, op uh, we're operational ready. Um, and we're going to continue to actively participate in state, regional, and national dialogue to advance the uh, field of emergency management. Um, in, in incorporating uh, nationally recognized best practices or evolving trends. Lastly, we're going to continue our outreach efforts um, to uh, con uh, coordinate and expand outreach education efforts to promote resilience in uh, the communities and businesses in our community, as well as uh, strengthen partnerships with private, public, nonprofit, and faith based organizations here within the city of Santa Fe. Our uh, primary accomplishments this past fiscal year. Um, we continue to support the planning and coordination efforts amongst many large-scale community events. This past year included the National Governors Association Conference. Um, that was a, a big one for us that we associated, we uh, assisted with. Uh, we deployed the city-county mass notification system, which is Alert Santa Fe. We coordinated the response and recovery amongst non-governmental, private, nonprofit, city, county, state, and federal agencies to the July 2018 flooding event, um, and we activated and staffed the Emergency Operations Center for 10 days during that. We developed the new Emergency Operations Center at the Midtown campus, which is very, very close to being fully operational. Uh, we continue to manage over 330, about $330,000 worth of federal grants that's, that are utilized by um, our office, the fire department, uh, the police department, and the regional airport in this past fiscal year. And uh, we developed a, uh, a group that we're calling the Emergency Management Coordinating Group that is representative of all city departments to continue our comprehensive planning efforts. Um, and uh, there was a question on the number of employees per department or division. Our office has two, including myself. Any questions from the committee? Councilor from Merrill Worth. What are you doing with regard to uh coordinating with schools around um, gun violence and making sure that we have some readiness if we were ever to face that horrific prospect? The schools do have an emergency manager, um, and they do have an emergency manager or a safety um, board that we sit on, as well as the police department. Um, that meets fairly regularly, and we do discuss those topics to ensure that the coordination amongst the response agencies here in the city um, are able to support the, the schools in the event of something to occur. Um, beyond that, um, we don't 
provide any funding to the schools from our office in, in, in the form of um, grant funding or anything. There is money that is available through the, um, through the Department of Homeland Security, through the state agencies. Um, but arguably, you'd be called if something happened. We would help coordinate the response, yes. Yeah. And uh, I guess the other question is uh, around um, stormwater, around flooding. Uh, what is your office doing in this budget, uh, given the, the experience from last year, um, to be ready in the future? The biggest thing that we're, we're focusing on for the next fiscal year is some of the, uh, there's, there's not much more we can do in the prevention aspect at this point with the infrastructure that we currently have until there's changes. Um, our office is able to, uh, we're, gonna, we're working to promote awareness of flood insurance to the community um, so that if there was a flood that uh, homes that are flooded may be protected, which, which many weren't um, in the flood last year. Um, we are procuring additional supplies to have on hand in the form of sandbags. But with storms that we have in the summer months, it's not always, we don't always have the, the advanced warning um, we didn't this past year to put that out, but it is something that we're looking at doing to help mitigate some of that flooding if it were to occur. And then um, more long-term initiatives would be in our mitigation plan that we're going to start developing now um, would be mitigation strategies to work in conjunction with the stormwater plan if there's projects identified in there to identify in our mitigation plan um, to mitigate fl uh, potential flooding areas in, in the city. I guess, you know, my last question would be also, you know, are you thinking about um, catastrophic fire incidents? Yes. And, and again, I guess in all three of these, whether it's, you know, something that happens in the schools, something that happens with regard to flooding or, or fire, you know, and we have displacement of people and businesses, are, are we as a city ready to um, respond appropriately uh, to help mitigate those situations. Yes, the city currently has an emergency operations plan that identifies key functions, um, and that is what we are revising right now and actually we're, we're redeveloping into a response plan. Um, and we've been meeting with various city departments to break down each of those functions. So one of them might be evacuation, and we've been meeting with the police department and the fire department to revise that and make it up to date um, so that if there was a fire or a flood or whatever, that prompted an evacuation, we have uh, applicable plans and policies in place that we can utilize. And we're doing that to a variety of different functions so that um, a function may be applicable to a fire or a flood or a tornado, it doesn't matter, but we have the elements in place to be able to handle the, the, the response to it. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Harris. Actually, Councilor Romero Worth uh, asked a question that I had about outreach, and so I'm covered there. I just wanted to say I, I continue to be impressed with Mr. Silver and the, and the professional level of emergency management services uh, that he provides. Uh, you know, I've worked with him a bit out at the airport you know, for the rules and rules and regulations associated with an airport security program, and, and again, I, I think he does a very good job. Thank you, David. Councilor Lindell. Councilor Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, David, you were previously, or are you still funded um, partly by um, the state? No, last fiscal year, that was the change, or this current fiscal year that we're in. Um, both myself and Kyle, uh, my emergency management specialist, are general funded. Um, our salaries are then are a match to that emergency management performance grant. So the, the one that was previously funding 50% of the salary for, the, uh, for my position is now utilized for other projects. This uh, current fiscal year, we use that to do a lot of the construction for the Emergency Operations Center. So none of it's going towards uh, salaries any longer? No, sir. Okay. But we're still getting the 50%? Yes. Okay. Um, have, have you seen, so you, you said a decrease in grants for your overall budget is the reason for uh, the significant decrease, 300 plus thousand, I think? The reason you see that is because of many of those grants, um, except for one of them, end at the end of this fiscal year or very early next fiscal year. 
and we have not yet received or know the award amount for uh, the next fiscal year, so we have not included it in the budget. So is it premature to ask if maybe the, I don't know if it's a decrease in grants, but uh, anything due to the, the fact that we're a sanctuary city, have you seen any? Uh, no, I have not, and I don't, I don't anticipate um, any significant decreases in the in the awards that we've received from previous fiscal years, but there's new administration at the agency, so I'm not sure how they're going to do allocation of the grants. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Councilor Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, wanted to congratulate you on the the Alert Santa Fe. I think it's a very um, helpful service that we have. It it notifies us on various levels and I'm just curious does that does that require a subscription it does um, we've partnered with uh, Santa Fe County on that and it's actually paid by um, Santa Fe County great sounds good that's all I have thank you Councilor V Hill Coppler mayor any last words before I call for a motion no but thank you okay <laughs> Councilor Rivera sorry David uh Councilor Vial just mentioned uh, the alert system, but I also know, uh, continue to get Nixle uh, responses, I guess, from the Sheriff's Office? From the Sheriff's Office. Um, we've been working with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to get them on board to Nixle. They can freely use it. Um, under previous administration, there was hesitation to adopt Alert Santa Fe. I think it's just they have not yet made that formal switch over. Okay, but then the intention is for them to... Yes, the intention is for both city and county to be utilizing a single platform. Good, thank you. Okay, Councilor Rivera, do you want to make a motion regarding emergency management? Uh, move for approval. Okay. We have a motion, second, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Okay, so now we will move back up to A, which is the mayor and council budget. Who will be presenting? Okay, so Mr. Chair, members of the committee, councilors, um, the mayor's budget this year, um, similar to city managers, is relatively simple. Uh, going through the recommended budget highlights, um, number one, for fiscal, fiscal year 20, the recommended budget for the mayor and council division, uh, we'll see a $207,600, or a 17% decrease from the fiscal year 19 levels. And the primary driver of this is because we took the positions that were originally put in there in last year's budget cycle uh, into the constituent and council services division that's been created under the city manager. And second, the fiscal year 20 recommended budget includes an accurate annual salary of 39106 or an increase of 15% for city councilors to reflect a change in state law in 2018, which increased the salary for city council so that has been placed into this budget uh, and finally the fiscal year 20 recommended budget includes additional resources for city councilors subscriptions travel and equipment so we did up that this year um, in terms of fiscal year 20 goals um, I think we have all heard the mayor's goals and his initiatives um, to make a city of Santa Fe user-friendly eco-friendly and family friendly uh, to put people first Make sure the city is a trusted partner in everything that goes on in this city. Create a high-performing city government uh, that people like to work with and delivers good results. Uh, in addition, to address housing needs in every part of the city, attack climate change, and ultimately promote good jobs and wages. Uh, the accomplishments from this fiscal year, fiscal year 19, was um, like it was for the city manager to establish a team that represents the first real administration under a full-time strong mayor in the city's history. Uh, as noted here, the team consists of 13 new directors, including eight women in leadership positions. Took the city government to the people by hosting the city council meetings throughout the city throughout 2018. Uh, we managed the all-hands-on-deck response to the thousand-year flood that was just referenced, talking about emergency management. Came together collectively with Santa Fe Fiesta Council, the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, and all Pueblo governors to achieve reconciliation by respectfully retiring the Entrada and finding a new expression of faith, adopted a sustainability plan that put city of, city of Santa Fe at the forefront of climate change, uh, began the successful Southside Summer Program, which will go on again this year, adopted a redevelopment framework for the Midtown Campus. 
So you see the breakout um, that's been presented and any specifics we can answer. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So no new positions are being proposed. Uh, that is correct, not in the mayor's office. Okay. Uh, questions of the Finance Committee, Councillor Rivera, Councillor Lindell, Councillor Harris. Thanks, Chair. Just one, one quick question. I'm looking uh, at the spreadsheet, and this would be for uh, dues. Um, the, this is be page two. Uh, at the, about halfway down. Most of them are familiar to me, uh, except I wonder about Los Alamos County at $10,000. What's that about? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Harris, uh, that's the um, Los Alamos County uh, Regional Coalition oh. or something like that. One we're familiar with. Right. One we're familiar with? Yes. All right. And those are our annual dues? That is correct. Okay. I'd love to see an operating budget for that regional coalition. And on that, who's our representative on that coalition? Do we have one? Councilor Ives, okay. Anything else, Councillor Harris? Councillor Romero Worth. Councillor Vigil Coppler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm wondering about, there's a number there for public financing, but I don't see any, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I don't see any proposed budget for that. <coughs> Public financing for elections. Is that going to be covered in the clerk's presentation? Mr. Chairman, you are correct. Okay. Because so. I didn't see it there either. Okay. Will okay. you make sure that All right. they highlight that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Virayel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So happy to see that we got our budget, our um, salary increase. And I was wondering, I thought there was other legislation that required an increase for counselors in previous years, not just 2018. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Villarreal, um, after conducting uh, research on this matter in conjunction with our city attorney, it was determined that that was the increase that happened um, in the last, uh, I believe, three years. But I can confirm and give you that information. Just want to make sure that we're up to par, just that we're following not just the state laws, but also that it's reflecting on our paychecks. Um, and then the other thing was, I, I do agree, I'd like to see the our contribution for the um, Coalition of Lionel Communities. We've been asking about that, but we never really got that formalized, so I appreciate that. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Rivera. I move for approval of the Mayor Council um, recommended budget. Okay, we have motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. Okay, well, that brings us to C, the City Attorney. Good afternoon, Councillor uh, Chair Abeta and members of the Council. Um, I have with me today Irene Romero, who is our office manager, and Jesse Gann, who is our legislative liaison. 
Um, Irene helps on the day-to-day -day operations of our office, including the budget, and Jesse um, actually did the research on one of our um, impact, uh, on the one of the things that impacted our budget um, this year for our proposal. So um, the mission of the city attorney's office, we actually just went through revision process, is to advise, defend, and protect the city and enforce its laws in a timely and just manner. Um, the main increases for the city attorney budget is a 9.2% increase of $160,000, and it's primarily driven by a correction in the number of employees in the city attorney's office. Um, we were actually, 13 of our 14 positions were funded in FY19, um, but all the funding has been restored for FY20. One of our paralegals was just left out of the budget last year. Um, and then the other thing is an increase in health insurance costs, um, which affects all the budgets. And then the other thing is an expansion of our um, Granicus software that's being proposed um, that will help streamline the committee process. And Jesse did the primary research on that, and that would affect all of our committees. Um, and it's basically an expansion to our existing software subscription um, to be the Legistar package. I mean, it's a better uh, public face, and it's a better um, way of loading all the agenda items as between committees. Okay, um, so the, again, the, the increase for the number of funded employees, this, this was employees you had, but it just wasn't correct. Correct, yes. Okay, in the budget, so it's not like you're coming and asking for another position. That's correct. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, um, questions from the committee. Councilor Rivera. Yeah, Mr. McCherry, can you um, just, what? I know you mentioned those positions, I didn't catch it, but what positions were they? Sure, we have um, two paralegals that are in City Hall and one that's at the Municipal Court, and one of the ones in City Hall was unfunded. So you just included that into the, the budget, okay. Um, I don't know if you heard the question I asked earlier, but there are uh, attorneys that provide services to the uh, public utilities uh, department. Um, have we found a way to really pull those funds from the enterprise fund for the amount of time spent doing water projects while in your office? Um, so, Councilor Abeta, or Chairman Abeta, Councilor Rivera, are you talking about the um, outside counsel that are through contracts? Not outside, internal. So a way to, it, similar to how, you know, City Hall pays for utilities um, by a transfer of funds, I believe that's happening. Does that happen then on the backward side for like enterprise funds that, that utilize your attorneys? Right. So Chairman Abeta, Council Rivera, my understanding is we have done that previously. We are not doing that currently. The entire budget for the city attorney's office is general fund. Um, so to answer McCoy, your question, no. Yeah. Ms. McCoy, does it make any sense to do that? In the past, it, that's the way they were pushing us to really um, provide services or funding from public utilities to the attorney's office if that's where 80% of the funds are being utilized. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Rivera, um, we do a general service assessment where HR, finance, city attorney, and various other aspects of that is funded out of the general fund, and we assess the utilities, um, a portion of that. Um, and so we collect monies from those utilities um, to reimburse for HR, finance, city attorney's office, and other departments within the city. Is part of a, just a general assessment. Um, we do not do on a specific invoice or a specific attorney or a specific case. It's more of over the last, these are the averages of what we expect them to pay. And it's allocated based on like IT services, where it's based on accounts, whether you have a computer, a phone, a laptop, that's three accounts. And so we have a way of assessing the utilities for these services, including the city attorney. So it's not based on total hours spent, it's just based on an average? Correct. Okay. So, McSherry, I don't, I don't know what would be more beneficial to your department to, I know, um, again, the, the water public utilities us, utilizes uh, the attorney, I think, uh, for a large amount of, of time and projects. 
maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's the way it used to be, but um, it seems like it might be beneficial to your department to be able to pull those enterprise funds to help fund uh, some of the services you're providing. I'm Chairman of ATA, Councilor Rivera, if we had a funding shortage in my office, I think that would be accurate. Right now we're being funded, so that's helpful, and, and we have the attorney assigned to that project. The water um, department does, I believe, pay for the contract services for some specific cases that we are defending for the city or pursuing on behalf of the city for that division. Um, so they're paying those contracts, I believe. Um, so, but one of the benefits of being a government attorney is not having to do billable hours. So, um, <laughs> in terms of our operations, I think the attorneys appreciate being able to dedicate the time they need to to the clients when they're asked to. But Maybe something just to watch out for. I mean, I'd be curious as to really how many hours attorneys spend in different areas, but all the funding's coming out of your budget. So, again, it's, it's a good year, so we don't have to worry about that, but maybe something to have handy in future years. Thank you. Councilor Lindell. Look at the amount of... Um, work that goes through that office. I think that it's astounding what gets accomplished. So thank you very much. Councilor Harris. Yeah, I want to echo Councilor Lindell and a thanks. When you start to look through the accomplishments, it's impressive and even more impressive about the list of goals that you have. You've got a lot of work outlined and uh, I, I think it's great. Uh, and a good job. Uh, I particularly appreciate a small model. Just getting the professional services agreements kind of standardized, uh, I think, uh, is something I've been advocating for. I, I had a question, though, on your spreadsheet. And this is the last sheet. Uh, and there's only two items. And services to uh, services of other city departments. So the actual was 101,000. Uh, I guess that's well. That was 18. The budget is 186 for 19, and now we're going to 195,807. So what's that about? What services of other city departments? What's that about? Chairman Abeta, Councilor Harris, that's an assessment made um, by the finance department as to our our allocation to pay, say, IT and the other departments that have that type of assessment. Okay, so that's the internal uh, transaction, if that's the right word. And it's IT, and what else would we be looking at? There would be fleet, fleet HR. Uh, we assess benefits, um, insurance, things that, you know, general costs that yeah. no one department should bear the full amount. And lastly, uh, I'm, I've been a real advocate of Granicus. In fact, it was down the other day, for me anyways, on Public Works. It was just had, they wanted an updated password. And so, um, but anyway, Granicus is a tremendous tool, and I'm glad to see we're taking advantage. Uh, I'm, I'm confident, given what they've done already, that their, their upgrades will really be a benefit for people who use it. So, anyway, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Romero Worth. A uh, couple quick questions. On your litigation goals, design an affirmative litigation program. What does that mean? Um, Chairman Abeta, Councilor Romero Worth. I'm excited to say that uh, Mike Prince and I got fellowships um, to be part of a class of attorneys um, across the U.S. that will be participating in an affirmative litigation planning process. Um, and that can be anything from enforcement of our existing ordinances to creating an additional program to meet the goals of the city. Um, so we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but we're going to an orientation in a month in Oakland, California at their city attorney's office, and we'll be with a bunch of other attorneys from across the U.S. Wow. Um, okay, and then I just wanted to say I'm really glad from a sustainability point that one of your goals is to, to reduce and eliminate, eliminate the use of paper and uh, have more electronic files. I, too, am trying to do that, not very successfully, but um, I think that's important that we think about those things. So, uh, And I also, I think, want to say that I'm very interested in revamping the committee and governing body procedures. Um, there's a lot of things uh, that we can do to 
be better in that regard. So happy to see it's a goal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two quick questions. So legislative liaison, is there, are there going to be two positions or is Jesse going to be the only <laughs> legislative liaison? Um, Chairman Obeza, Councillor Villarreal, we have the position for the assistant um, funded. So we're, we're assessing how things are going right now. So this, this year we are prioritizing filling the paralegal position. We just, I believe, got it posted recently. So um, we were adjusting our priorities um, for this fiscal year. So we'll see how things roll out. But right now that is one of the positions that is funded. So we intend to- For this budget. So there is this- FY20, yes. Okay. Yes. And then this was my question last year, and I know that it's looking, you all are looking at it com comprehensively, but did you all, since you have specific legal um, requirements, do you have a budget for translation or interpretation needs or services as it relates to legal matters and specifically um, the living wage? Um, Chairman Abeta, Councilor Villarreal, we don't have a specific budget for that, but I think um, we, we, if we needed to use it, I think we could probably find, but we don't have something specific. And um, it seems like we're averaging about one complaint a month right now since I've gotten here, or every other month maybe, or two every three months, something like that. Um, and I know we've had at least some Spanish-speaking um, complainants come through Somos en Pueblo Unido, and so I know they've helped out with that sometimes. Um, so no, to answer your question, no, there's not a specific line item. I also haven't had to contract for that specifically. In the past, there were letters, the formal letters about the legal matter that they um, needed in Spanish, and we, I think they used um, an online translation service that, that wasn't great. But I'm just curious if that, if you all are utilizing, especially as it relates to communication with legal matters, that you have somebody in, on staff that can produce a letter in Spanish, or you have somebody that can help with that. I'm Chairman Abeta, Council of Villarreal. I think we would contract specifically for that. We have several Span Spanish speaking, at least conversational members, but none of us are certified as interpreters or anything else like that. So does that require a budget line item for the need for translation? Council of Villarreal, Council of Villarreal um, I think if we were to contract for it, it would. I haven't had to yet. And I will look into the letters to see if they're up to date. Okay. Yeah, because I think in the past there were people that didn't know that there was that option, and so when they would receive letters in English, they couldn't understand what was happening legally. So just so we're prepared, I don't know if that necessarily requires a line item budget, but that we have that um, at the back of our, or the forefront to think about that when we have to communicate with community members on legal matters. But you do have a contractual services budget line item that that would probably come out of, right? Okay. Chairman Abeta, Councilor Villarreal, we have a legal services um, category. And so for something recent I did work on an outside council we contract with, we're going to subcontract with a interpreter for a specific purpose. Um, but we don't have a separate line item for that. So if there were a contractual matter we were in that related to litigation, we certainly could. Um, I might have to move something from there to a different contract. I'm not sure. I have to talk to budget. I mean, feel like you have adequate funding right now to cover any of those needs that may arise this next fiscal year. Can, Chairman Abeta, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Because I share Councillor Villarreal's concern. I, we don't want <coughs> you to provide this because you we didn't give you funding for it. Uh, anything else? So, thank you. Uh, Councillor Vigil Coppler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in On the spreadsheet, you have under legal services, contractual services, $50,000. And you had, that in, you had that in the base budget this year, if I'm reading this right, and you're recommending 50000 next fiscal year. The previous year, in 18, the budget was at 79.8. So is, has is that 50000 used for the attorneys who staff committees as well as attorneys that you outsource legal work to? Chairman Abeta, Councillor V. Hill Coppler. Um, that funding is used for, it's for basically outside counsel on specific matters. 
Um, the reason that the FY18 was particularly high is because um, former city attorney Gino Zamora, I think his, his contract was at least partially funded out of that category. So it was an unusual situation. Okay, so the, how, well, does the, the attorney pay come out of this contractual services budget for those who staff some council committees? Chairman Abeta, Council Viva Coppler, um, generally those attorneys are from my staff. Um, well, so they're, on, they're under the personnel service. I guess I'm thinking about maybe the, the boards, the county city boards. For example, SWAMA and um, Buckman Diversion Board. Chairman of Eight, the Council of Hill Coppler, no, that's not funding those attorneys. I believe that's coming out of those boards' budgets directly. So, for example, like Nancy Long for the Buckman. Right. Yeah, I think that's out of their budget directly. So we don't contribute as this from the city our part of those services. Chairman of Eight, just not from my budget. I think. So it, I mean, from okay, a different so budget. So the that would be in utilities and okay. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is, um, I'm glad to see in your goals a proposed blighted property ordinance, because that's one of the things I'm very, very interested in. Um, and so definitely would like to participate in that development of that. And um, the other question I have is with regard to preparation of fiscal impact reports. Is that something that is a responsibility that comes through your office, or is that parceled out to any department who has requests before committees? Um, Chairman of HTA Council V. Hill Coppler, so the fiscal impact reports generally start in Jesse's office, and then he works with the folks mm -hmm. that are drafting the legislation to prepare them and with finance. Um, does that answer your question fully? Well, I, yeah, I wanted to know where that responsibility rested. and. Is there training on that that people who prepare these get? For example, they're very different than what you see prepared like for legis state legislative committees. And there's not enough detail. And um, I'm just wondering if, if, there's maybe, if there maybe could be a, another goal <laughs> to hype those up a little bit because they're not as well I think they're not as well in, they don't have as much information as we need. For example, uh, there was something that maybe said $10,000. Well, there's no delineation of how that w was arrived at. And if there's an FTE in there, there's no delineation of how that number was arrived at. And typically I see what's w like things like, what's the drawback if you don't approve this? Well then we just don't approve it. It's kind of like the answer. So there needs to be a little more analysis, I think, um, on those. And so I'm just suggesting that because I believe in my own review of matters that come before us, it would be a little bit more helpful and would probably avoid a lot of questions when these things are presented. So thank you for that. And that is all I have. Uh, on that point, yes. Councilor? It, it, and the ten thousand, I think that Councillor V or Councillor V Hill Coppler is. I don't know why the V R A L V Hill Coppler. It must be the V thing. I think <laughs> the right V is, is talking about is you know. It, so then you get one F I R says ten thousand. You have no idea what's in that ten thousand, and then suddenly in the next meeting it's twenty thousand, and it's like oh well, where'd that ten thousand come from, and why? And it just seems like if we're making these decisions and money is a factor. It would be helpful to have more detail in in the estimates that are coming forward. I do have one other question, Mr. Chair. Sure, go ahead. I uh, I remember when I was running for this office, uh, there was a lot of concern uh, about what your office does, and this was prior to you being here. So I just curious around uh, enforcing our living wage and wage theft, and just curious. Uh, what's happening with that in your um, department now that you're in charge? Thank you. Uh, Councillor, um, uh, Chairman Abeta, Councillor Romero Worth. Um, we actually just met with um, the new workforce secretary on Thursday morning about collaborating with that department. Um, so uh, there's a specific procedure that's in our ordinance that we are following, um, and we are interested in 
and making that as effective as possible. So I think that's one of the areas that affirmative litigation could be focused on. Um, but the, the secretary did ask us to, to support him and his efforts, and we're, we're definitely going to do so. Um, and then we're looking at ways that we can collaborate with them as well. Um, so I would say one of the new attorneys I'll be hiring in the next month is going to be assigned to that area. So once they're on board, I think it'll be easier to come up with more specific um, items on how that will work. But um, there are partic some particular cases that the Labor Department is interested in us supporting them on in Santa Fe as they move forward. And um, so that, that's, that's our starting point. And I think we've been successful in a few cases in the last six months in recovering um, salary for employees. There's two active cases, right, or one active case right now, I believe. The, and the one before that was anonymous, so once we get the employer's response, there's not much more we can do. So they essentially defend themselves. It seems like it's, it's an area um, where there's a lot more we could do and should be doing um, to support workers. So I just would flag that to your attention as, as something, especially to talk with the advocates about what they're seeing, what workers are experiencing, how we get better communication uh, to them about what their avenues are for um, bringing forward uh, complaints and, and making sure that we're really enforcing uh, the laws that we have. Chairman Abita, Councillor Romero, I didn't encourage any of you who know about complaints to make sure that they're being lodged with our CRS folks and then they work with us to get that process started. We haven't had a lot of complaints since I've gotten here. Okay, is there a motion regarding the city attorney's budget? Councilor Rivera. Mayor, before I go on, when I was a fire chief, Irene Romero used to harass me all the time, so I'm really thinking of a question for her, but <laughs> I can't come up with one, so... He'll take hoping, a motion. I was hoping to get her back. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we approve the city attorney's uh, budget recommendations. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so we are on to D, constituent and council services. I know, right? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Sig, you want to come sit down? <laughs> um, so I'll do uh, my brief overview, uh, budget highlights. Um, you know, um, thank you, Councillor Lindell. You got me nervous when you <laughs> said that. <laughs> You're right. I am at this table all by myself. Um, so we have the, um, obviously, budget highlights for this year was the creation of the Constituent and Council Services Division. Um, one other request includes funding for um, the development of a new city website. And then additionally, there was uh, funding allocated through the 2018 GRT bond for the new CRM manager uh, system, so relationships manager system, which is our CRM system. Um, for our uh, fiscal year uh, 20 goals, you know, uh, it's to put out the RFP to obtain the new constituent relationships manager system. Uh, we are a few days out from actually uh, releasing that RFP. Additionally, we're working um, on the RFP for the new website. Right now, we're still working to create and utilize district and specific interest specific email distribution tools. Um, we're in the process of redeveloping the processes for the constituent services uh, portion of our um, team to kind of transition from traditionally being the complaint department to being more of an informational hub, uh, kind of a help desk feel. We've had great success with just the minor steps that we've done uh, to implement that. And then also uh, working to redevelop how we receive and distribute both our calls, concerns, and CRM tickets. Um, amongst our goals is to have some consistent customer-wide service uh, 
excuse me, citywide customer service trainings, and then also to roll out a series of town hall meetings uh, throughout the city. So, do you want me to go through the 2019 accomplishments thus far as well? Uh, no, we can go to straight to questions. I think Councilor Rivera has a question, Councilor. Thanks, Councilor Halsic. So your budget looks like it. It increases from 371 to 418, 693, but you only talk about the 75,000. What else does that entail? Uh, Council Rivera, it's actually as we've segregated it out into an, a kind of a new budget, there's different services that weren't generally accounted for before because they were under the city manager budget. So just even some of the other um, items, including the city website, are in there. Ms. McCoy, do you have a breakdown? Do you know why there's such a, a gap? Mr. Chairman, uh, if you, on page one of the budget detail, the only page, the largest contributor to the increase is for salaries. And as we indicated with the city manager's budget, we have moved the positions from the city manager's, all positions from the city manager's office, I'm sorry, the mayor's office into, um, into its standalone division. And so now all positions are located within one budget unit uh, to provide the ease of tracking in the future for these expenses. Whereas before, not all of the uh, council and constituent services positions were budgeted in the same business unit. So the 371, 784 for 16, 17 was basically the old constituent services? Sorry, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Councilor Rivera, where are you referencing which number? Uh, page four uh, under constituent and council services. Actual expenditures for sixteen seventeen. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rivetta, I'm referring to page one, um, the fold out in your budget binder. Okay, but I'm referring to page four of the constituent and council services. Okay, yes, now I'm on page four. So those are the actual expenditures for 16, 17, and I guess 17, 18, the old constituent services budget? Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rivera, yes, that is correct. All right, so the increase of the, f to the, of an increase of 418, 693 is the three positions. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rivetta, yes, this is a transfer of positions that were previously budgeted in the mayor's office to be centrally located in the constituent services. Office. And those are all the new p positions that were approved? We can get you a breakdown, yes, that is correct. Okay. Have there been any other transfers into this division? Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilor Rivera, that is, those are the only transfers of positions. We, but we can get you a breakdown. That way we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's all I have for now. Councilor Harris. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> so, Ms. Mahelsik, you know, I, um, I made a note to myself of growing pains. That might not be the right way to characterize it, but you know, it's a new group and there's, there's some new uh, new people, including yourself, as of this past year. So we now have the constituent and council services division. Your division director, is that correct? Correct. And so under your your position as division director, we have who and what what positions? Probably just what positions do we have? The, uh, that are incorporated in this proposed budget? Uh, constituent services, council services, uh, neighborhood engagement, and then um, right now multimedia. 
within, it's actually within uh, the city manager's position. Wait a minute. So we have constituent services, council That's liaison. Yes, neighborhood engagement. Neighborhood engagement, which we have not filled. Correct. Correct. And then, but multimedia, I'm confused on. I, I apologize. I've been working closely with multimedia. Okay, so it's not part of your group. No, it's part of our okay. collaboration. For so our again, group. given the growing pains, and we now have this new division, how are constituent services and council liaison? How are you proposing that they work together? Because I don't see that happening so far, and I realize growing pains, but so I think that's one of your challenges. Absolutely, um, you're right. Growing pains, um, but right now we've we have been working closely in terms of tracking um, kind of long-standing concerns, outreach, uh, overarching issues and items across the city, and then matching that against um, kind of our so both our council concerns and then our constituent services uh, concerns, and we're collaborating and cross-training so that uh, we can. Can be proactive in our approach for uh, uh, and just issues that are coming forward. So we have, I would say, constituent services, the easiest way to break it down, Councilor Harris, is a lot of our um, routine, our potholes, our complaints for weeds and so forth. Our constituents, our council services, excuse me, are uh, really working to identify the larger areas and needs for the councilors and then also um, the issues that kind of stretch city-wide, so they're not responding to um, individual pothole complaints per se, but really working in the overall collaboration for how we move forward um, with larger items across the city. Well, I th I th it really, it is going to be one of your challenges to make all this work. It strikes me as there is some duplication of efforts, uh, and, and, it's, and it's definitely not clear to myself as a counselor, who I very much appreciate, uh, have appreciated uh, Councilor Liaison and, and Isabel Sharp. Uh, but again, uh, you know, it's it's difficult for me to, uh, if I get a call, I mean, automatically, so far, the last few months, I just turn, simply turn to my liaison. And so the, again, I think you have to, you're going to have to watch out for that, the duplication of effort. And then I know, you know, the neighborhood engagement. That discussion has, goes back uh, to the, um, you know, uh, the, the last election. Quite frankly, it's hard to see where that person would fit in. Uh, you know, again, I think you can have more duplication of effort there. So, I think before you really rush into this, I think we sh it should be outlined fairly clearly at some point, not now, uh, uh, that this is how it's going to work together. Thank you, Councilor Harris. I that recommendation and I'm working on kind of a breakdown uh, to make that a little bit clear. We also are meeting as a department uh, pretty frequently so that we can make sure uh, no one's kind of crossing over. There's a lot of communication within our group, so okay. try not to duplicate the effort. Okay. Very good. That's all I have, Chair. Mr. Chair, members of the council, I have to apologize. I misspoke and confused not only you all but Christine as well. So the multimedia position is the one that is within constituent and council services. The PIO position, although the, the multimedia budget is in the city manager's office, the PIO position is the one that's in the city manager's office. So I apologize for misspeaking and confusing Ms. Minelsk. So then I have a follow-up question then. So what are the responsibilities of a multimedia work? Is that a new position, yet another position? No, that's, that's something. Uh, Joe Abeta. Oh. So Joe actually falls within. So Joe, yeah. Congratulations, big guy. <laughs> I think someone promoted him to director for <laughs> Councilor Villarreal. Was that you? <laughs> Councilor uh, Romero Worth. Okay, so just kind of following up the same line. Um, wh when, what is the timing for the neighborhood uh, liaison or whatever we're calling that person, the neighborhood position? Neighborhood engagement coordinator position. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've actually advertised twice for the position, and we just haven't found the right uh, person. So right now we are uh, reevaluating the job description to see if there's any small changes that we can make to maybe um, entice a different um, different pool of candidates, and then we hope to have that filled. But some of the feedback received was that um, it would be helpful to just 
slightly tweak some of the wording to include organizational outreach. So without putting you on the spot, but sort of putting you on the spot, what exactly do we want this person to do? Um, a lot of our organizational coordination um, and neighborhood level engagement, um, that's currently the focus of it. And I quickly um, think of things like our um, short-term rental type outreach and communication, collaboration, neighborhood engagement, um, organizational engagement with um, like that, or our, um, I'm sorry, I just lost. So let me help you. Um, so when you, you threw out short-term rentals, and um, is, is the idea that maybe uh, this person would help communicate uh, changes in legislative things that we're considering to make sure that neighborhoods understand how they would impact them or making sure that they um, have a, a channel of, of communication uh, on legislative proposals? Is that something that you, Mayor, mayor you want to? This person? Let, me, let me see if I can uh, offer some, yeah, some that'd, thoughts that'd be great. here. Um, I think there are different lanes and there are different uh, functions, but they all add up to a coherent whole. The, the particular function that Councillor Harris was asking about with regard to a uh, council liaison position, really what it, was, it derived from last year's discussion about helping to professionalize staff up and support the council in a variety of ways and provide a lane for support that historically had not existed, where everybody on the city council was essentially a free agent and operating on their own as best they could, depending on their own work circumstance or uh, time capability. And so, as we talked about uh, professionalizing the management of the city government overall, uh, the idea w that really came out of our hearings last year was, well, let's, let's really professionalize the capability of council members to have support. So that's a lane. We also have a traditional function, which is to field the concerns, complaints, and uh, citizen-based issues that really go into the departments and need to be parceled out and held uh, in a coherent way so there's a circle that gets closed when a file is opened, it's responded to, and then there's a resolution. And we'll come back to that one in a minute. There's a third lane that we're working on which I think really goes to the question of uh, community engagement. Uh, increasingly, as we look at the way the city uh, does business, and this goes back to the, some of the opening remarks I made about getting out of our silos, we are profoundly in the community engagement business, whether it has to do with the uh, expansion of the airport and the impact that, that uh, the, ra the issues that will inevitably uh, raise with, with neighborhood uh, adjacent to the airport. It has to do with questions of water reuse and concerns over that, or the development of the Midtown campus. These are all different departments, but they're all the same platform, which is how do we go about engaging with the people of Santa Fe in a constructive and consistent and coherent and hopefully collaborative way. My hope and, and uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Madam Director. Um, we have, we've advertised twice. This is a position that is um, an evolving description. We have not yet found the person to hire, and we're not going to just fill it to fill it. Uh, I think it is a, a job that, in some ways, again, cuts across our departments. You heard uh, from the city attorney's office all the different ways in which, and, and you correctly raised the question about how does the city attorney engage with the community when it comes to wage theft or issues of uh, tenants' rights? That's an engagement issue. And so I think that you know, finding the right person to help us build an engagement platform, strategy, and then a program is really what, what we're looking for. It goes beyond a any one political issue. It has much more to do with seeing the city as a uh, uh, consistent uh, partner in engaging with community issues across the city. 
There are uh, nonprofits, national nonprofits, that have developed best practices that we've uh, been in touch with. Uh, the, this is an area where the U.S. Conference of Mayors has done a great deal of work, and that's one of the areas where we, we are plugged in to get best practice as well. But I think we do need a dedicated position in that lane, if there are two or three different lanes in this office, that helps to design an engagement platform that cuts across almost every single one of these touch points where we're trying to do a much better job of listening and engaging our, our residents. So, Mayor, that's very helpful, and perhaps we're calling this the wrong thing. Well, that would not be the first time that we have called something the wrong thing. I absolutely because agree. Because I think your, your thinking, and now my understanding has evolved, uh, because I think this was very neighborhood specific, and now, and I agree, the community engagement piece has been huge. There's been several things that I've been working on. Uh, I'll just add another to the pool, the bicycle ma master plan, um, you know, needed more uh, uh, outreach. We actually uh, delayed um, accepting the draft for public comment because we are de delaying. I, I, it's going out. I, we're approving it at the MPO tomorrow night, I think, or Thursday night for public review, another layer of public review. But the problem is it didn't have the right kind of community engagement. We didn't get the broad spectrum that we were looking for. Um, certainly the, the water reuse is another area where we need to be engaging the, the community. So it seems like maybe this is, needs to be a, a community outreach type position rather than the narrow neighborhood engagement that it was originally been cast. I think the word engagement is the critical uh, term of art, whether we call it community engagement or neighborhood engagement yeah. or resident engagement. But I think what we're seeing, and this is a national phenomenon, I think this is something that's happening in cities and communities across the country. Um, as we, as every city deals with issues of um, equity, uh, non-displacement uh, strategies for managing uh, the way we are as a, as a very diverse community, trying to listen to and uh, earn the trust of all of the residents of the city, having one of the pieces in this, uh, in this office uh, looking at and helping us to build an engagement strategies, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think what it also says to me is that creation of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this constituent and council services uh, operation was exactly the right thing to do. I mean, we were I'm not sure we knew exactly why it was the right thing to do. I don't think we necessarily had all of the... I, I did. Oh, okay. I'm glad you did. Uh, and I will give you credit for that. But the, I think what we were doing was picking up um, faint signals that what we were doing wasn't working right and that what we were doing, while it was well-intentioned, wasn't well-coordinated. And so some form of a centralized uh, operation that could take these related but different lanes and bring them into a coherent whole under a, a position of leadership had to make sense. And I think uh, Councillor Harris is right. It, it is going to continue to grow and evolve and find the best expression, but the instinct is right that these are pieces that need to be put together. So a couple more questions, Mr. Chair. Um, so as, as you look um, at the CRM system as part of your goals, uh, where was it, to put out a new RFP to get a new CRM system. I, I just have to register this complaint um, one more time. I think it's well known. Um, you know, when I was putting things into that system, it's a one-way street. Um, I'm not getting the feedback about what happens to the constituents I feed into that, and that is very frustrating. Um, because I care about my constituents. I want to know, A, that their problem was addressed. I want to know how it was addressed. I want to know that it was, you know, addressed appropriately to their satisfaction. And I, when it's, it's basically a black hole. And you know this. I think we all have experienced it. I just want to emphasize that that is really frustrating from where I sit. And I, honestly, I've stopped referring things because I don't know what happens to them. Um, along that line, I will say that I have a constituent who uh, I referred to, and, and um, without going into too great a detail, over a year ago. Um, 
nothing is happening on that. Uh, this, this poor individual has been tossed around this city actually for years. Um, and unfortunately, to, to go back to lanes and to go back to what people um, need to be doing, you know, I need a constituent services and I'm, and I'm not, we're, we're having growing pains is a great way to put it. But, but at case in point, what we need to do is whoever that constituent person, constituent services person who was referred that needs to have the power to be able to help coordinate all the players that need to help in, in getting something. So I'm not laying this on the constituent services person in, in particular. I, it's, it's, a, it's a system problem that we need to figure out um, how to serve better the constituents who do come to us. So um, just to register that point. And then back the other point on lanes is our constituent, um, or not our, they're not, our, our council people. You know, I think one of the, the areas where um, these folks can be important to us is in policy development. And with that comes, I think, very personal relationships. And I would argue that in the long run, we may need more of these people um, and that we need to pay attention to how they're hired so that their personal relationships can be built. Um, so those are some things to be thinking as we think about this office and how it grows and how it serves uh, both the community and the, and the council and um, you know how, how it conducts the work that it does. So that's all I have and I just wanted to you know, make make those points, and so that we're aware as we move forward. Yes, thank you, Councilor Lindell. Um, I would just make a quick comment that it's been really um, it's been helpful to me with the um, constituent service people. They've been responsive on some things that. Um, have been very helpful to me. And the only comment I'll make on the, uh, uh, are we still calling it neighborhood liaison mayor? Or did you throw, did you drop that? Engagement, en neighborhood engagement. That sounds so much sweeter. Um, uh, I, um, my only thoughts on that are that, um, and I've expressed this before, I think we definitely need a person who is um, well-versed in the collection of data and well-versed in being able to put together, um, if we're doing surveys and that kind of thing and, and asking this person to do it, I would hope that they have some kind of sophistication in uh, statistics because we have um, we've not done very well in the past with the surveys that we've put together. and. I, the data that we get out of them is probably statistically um, not very useful. So I would hope that the person has some background in um, data and research. And thank you, Chair, for, um, is there anyone else? I'll make a motion. Uh, Councillor Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree. My issues that I've been having just with the changes of the de department I share with um, Councilwoman Rometta Worth, and I think we're getting there. Um, I guess the integration of people that have been in that department have been extremely important. Um, the institutional knowledge that people have had that I think sometimes gets disregarded. Um, for me, that institutional knowledge has been extremely helpful because there's things that have happened in the past decades that there's certain staff people that know exactly how it didn't work well or how we tackled that problem. And so I think we need to value not just this department, but all departments where we have institutional knowledge of people that have years and tenure of experience um, in our city. It's extremely important. And um, I think we need to constantly remind ourselves. New doesn't necessarily mean that New people don't necessarily mean that all problems are solved internally. So I just want to make that point. I think with constituent, constituent services, the institutional knowledge for me um, with the staff that has that has been extremely helpful. And trying to integrate that with new people and new ideas is important. But 
you know, I don't think we've gotten there yet. And the fact that we all are separated by different, the districts are not, we don't have the same constituent services person. I'm willing to try to keep working on that. I just think there are duplication of efforts and also miscommunication and sometimes um, weird dynamics between our fellow counselors because people didn't get, didn't hear about an issue that directly affected our, our district. So I think we just need to be cognizant of that. Um, one thing I just want to praise is the social media um, exposure and the presence that we have is so much better since I've been here. It's really focusing more on departments, what they're doing, um, being more proactive about communication. I think that's been very helpful um, and I'm glad to see that's going to continue. I, w I just had one question. It said a rollout for town hall meetings. Can you explain that more? Absolutely. So playing a bit, uh, Councilor Villarreal, off of the outreach and the social media, we've seen huge spikes in our engagement since we've basically what we've started to do is taken what we hear from constituent services. Um, I'll use potholes as an example because it's potholes. It's been our favorite campaign. Um, so we took kind of all, everything we were hearing about that and we turned that into a collaboration of information with Public Works, what we were doing, a game plan, a full summary for our website. With the help of Joe, we created informational videos about what our crews were doing and how to report potholes. And then we did a full-blown social media campaign with engagement reaching over 50,000 people um, in notifications. And so um, when we look at those and we're analyzing kind of the increases and spikes through those types of campaigns, um, we thought and we've heard uh, through feedback that it would be great to kind of take that same type of informational dis uh, information distribution, excuse me, uh, to, to our um, districts, to different parts of our city. I think Joe also reemphasized that when he was talking about stats for meetings watched, uh, like the South Side meeting that had a much higher rate. And so now that we're really working into community engagement, a bit more than we ever have before. Uh, we're starting to see that our people, um, we wanna go to the community and the community wants us to go to them. So the idea is to do uh, a series of events and this also has come up through some of our strategic planning and department meetings uh, where we've said, well, what if we got together a group of um, either directors, division directors and staff to kind of explain what the city does at a variety of town halls um, at different locations throughout the city. So just some ideas. I think everyone has done, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for realizing we do have some growing pains. Um, it's hard to believe I, I haven't even been here for six months. Uh, liaisons haven't really been on you know, staff for about, uh, I think, two or three months. We had some long-term staff that uh, was out for several months, so uh, we actually, jokingly said that this is kind of our first full month with everybody on board. And so we are working through some of that. In addition to all of that, we lost our PIO in the middle of all of the transition. And so we're really working to find the ways that we best um, can collaborate. We've you know, really been trying to incorporate summaries for background information because uh, my department has a wealth of institutional knowledge that I could not be more grateful for. Um, and so I think we're all just still really trying to figure out like the authority levels for really pushing on staff to make sure that problems are being addressed and we're on top of them timely and how we re-deliver that information and those updates. And so um, we're really looking for different ways just across the board, but um, definitely trying to boost our community engagement and our interaction. And um, one of the things I think the mayor has said, and then I'll, um, stop chatting is that we've previously worked in silos. What we've seen with the development of the Constituent Council Services is to be honest with you, I've been hit with like a tsunami um, <laughs> because everybody wants us to engage, participate with community engagement, social media campaigns. I mean, we just launched a whole one with operational uh, spring blitz with the police department. Uh, we did the Easter egg hunt where for the first time ever, uh, my office helped coordinate all of the public uh, safety. So we had fire trucks, uh, streets department took snow plows, uh, recycling took trucks. So that type of engagement, we're kind of 
hitting it because for the first time there has been this cross section of a multitude of um, areas. So um, I think that's one of the things, is, as everyone mentioned, we, we're having some growing pains, but I feel like we're kind of getting into a good rhythm. And, and truthfully, we've had about a month of everybody in my department um, kind of present and are able to establish some of those uh, lanes a little bit more clearly and create some more department meetings. Thank you. I appreciate the team and everybody that's part of it and also where you've picked up the slack. Thank you. So I think there's still several questions that Councilor Rivera has and Councilor Vigil Coppler. So we're going to stop right now. We're going to pick up tomorrow with uh, constituent council services. So that'll be the first item we deal with tomorrow at 1 o'clock. At this time, I'd like to call up our, yeah, Councilor Rivera. Can I have a, uh, Ms. McCoy? Um, so I'm really interested in what's going into the, the difference between the 362, 435, or the 1819 mid-year budget, and then the uh, new proposed budget. So what's what makes up that 418, 693? So if you can bring that to us tomorrow, that would be great. Absolutely. And we can start with that. And also, what positions are budgeted in in this division? Okay. All right, so with that, I'd like to uh, call up our Ask Me representative. Uh, we're going to spend the last 30 minutes uh, giving 10 minutes each to Ask Me. Uh, then we'll hear from our police officers representative and then our fire department union representative. And so uh, this is your opportunity to speak to us about uh, anything budget related, the discussion you've heard and the uh, things that uh, we will be discussing in the coming days. So this is kind of your opportunity to tell us what you think is important for us to hear. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Gutierrez. I work, of course, for Public Works Stormwater Division. I'm the president of Ask Me Local 3999. I want to start out by thanking the mayor, oh, he's not here, and all the members of city council for your interest in improving employee pay and improving labor management relationships. My union represents over half of the city employees, and we look forward to progress in the coming year. There are four points I want to emphasize. One, we currently represent about 760 employees. The definition of this bargaining unit is regulated by Article 1 through 3 of the contract and also by state law. We are occasionally concerned that managers want to change union positions to non-union positions, so we want to remind upper management of these provisions. There is a labor management committee empowered by the contract to decide on these matters. Second, fiscal 2020 is the last year of the three-year collective bargaining agreement between my union and the city. We hope the mayor and his new team and the city council will see our bargaining agreement as instruments both sides can use to work in the open and to the negotiated improvements that will benefit citizens. Our current CBA collective bargain agreement, of course, and the city contains a classification and pay plan in Article 26. Article 26 also states that ASME members receive a 2% across the board increase for the year starting July 1, 2019. It was a section covering temporary raises for people who are asked to work temporarily beyond their typical duties and other raises described in the article are permanent. The contract also requires that the two sides negotiate any increases above those already agreed to, such as a 2%. We know management is preparing a plan for implementation of the new system of job titles and pay grades to go with the new titles. We look forward to negotiating with management on this plan as soon as they are ready, probably before negotiations start on the successor contract. The... Um, 2018-2020 contract itself will expire on June 30th, 2020. In 2017, because contract negotiations started late, our union began working in physical 2018 without a contract, and the two sides did not reach an agreement until September. We think a timely negotiations and agreement is in everyone's interest, and we propose the start of negotiations as on a successor agreement in the autumn of this year. We work openly, constructively with management on compensation reform without 
preconditions other than those specified in the contract. We would like the HR department to, to provide its proposals based on the Spring Set study as soon as possible. And we are glad to sit down immediately to negotiate an implement, implementation. Article 26, Section 8 contemplates a classification and compensa compensation survey done by management every three years for implementation in the fourth year. Although this survey done in physical year 2018 was behind schedule, we were glad to see we were glad to see it. Section 8 also says that the new pay ranges will be proposed for all classifications covered by the ASME contract. We are working now with administration to complete this list. To us, every open position means a manager has worked through the process and justified a new employee. Temporary raises are costly because we want employees to be well compensated for the work they do beyond the call of duty, but we hope management will make less use of them in the future. We want those positions staffed fully by a fair and efficient recruiting process. Past management no longer making policies too often saw budget, budgeted positions as opportunities to save by not hiring. Our union advocates that open positions be staffed in efficient recruiting process, that both new and existing employees be compensated fairly, and that both existing and new employee benefits from a series and well-funded training plan. Opportunities for training are in the spirit of our contract with the city and make this and make basic sense for the city. The basic, excuse me, the best incentives for workers to perform and exert themselves are opportunities to learn, to be trained, to be promoted, and to be rewarded by permanent pay increases. Lastly, we look forward to negotiations in the rest of 2019 to improve employee pay and to discuss all matters to prepare for more years of cooperative work. I want to thank all of you. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to limit the questions or comments because I want to make sure each union gets the same amount of time and I don't want to spend, I don't want to shortchange any of the other unions. So, Michelle, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. It. Okay, so if we can have a representative from the police officers union, that would be great. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, um, Chairman Rita, members of this committee, on behalf of the Santa Fe Police Officers Association, which I am president of, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Manager Wolfenberg, Chief Padilla, um, and members of this committee for your efforts in dealing with a serious issue that has affected the Santa Fe Police Department in the past year, where our officers were leaving the department for other agencies. Your proposal shows that you have a true that you have been true to your word, and not have have not kicked the can down the road as it has been for so many years in the past. You have made a com commitment to the citizens of Santa Fe to provide the best public safety possible, and we thank you for that. If I may, I'd like to remind you that this is a still a process uh, which needs to be continued. We need to continue to take steps forward, however small, but to keep moving forward and continue compensation and stay competitive with other agencies to avoid our officers from leaving in the future and attract qualified officers to join our department. We are currently in negotiations, which I feel we can uh, wrap up rather quickly. Again, our union thanks you, and we are confident that we can continue this process together to benefit the citizens of Santa Fe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we could hear from the fire department. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, again, it's been a while since I've had a chance to talk to you. If, if you forgot my name, my name is uh, Jason Arwood. I'm uh, the Santa Fe Firefighters Association president. Um, we're honored here uh, to have a little time to talk to you um, in, in this process, and we thank you for the opportunity. Um, 
Right now, we're, we're very pleased to endorse Chief Babcock's current plan of his new EMS division. We're in full support. It is a huge, huge leap forward. Uh, this department has been a, sort of a leader in EMS in a lot of ways. We've been handling EMS for over 30 years, and we're a very proud. Uh, we have the opportunity to be a rare, what they call a single tier service for EMS. A lot of times when people visit cities, uh, you see the guys on the fire trucks and, and the ladies working, uh, and there'll be a third party ambulance, and they're great, uh, but they kind of come and go and they can be bought and sold. Our city has very fortunate to have in the city uh, folks that have been well trained and they have a ton of experience, and so um, we're very proud. And not, not only are they paramedics and EMTs, but they're also incredible firefighters, and so uh, that may not be the same experience all cities get to get. So uh, we're, we're very fortunate in that. And again, like I said, I want to make it very clear. We absolutely endorse and support Chief Babcock's uh, plan, and we look forward to kind of help molding that process as it goes along. So thank you again. Uh, we want to touch on just a couple things. I know uh, time is short. And uh, the class and comp study that came out, um, there were some issues with it. And I think the single tier system um, really wasn't touched on. I think. It's difficult to understand what a fire department in another city who operates uh, with a third or second party ambulance service really doesn't have the same workload. And so it's important to, if you ever get a chance, come and ride with us and you can see how hard our men and warm, women work on a daily basis. And so uh, the class and comp study put a lot of our union positions at the kind of the lower end or the middle end. And, um, you know, as we go forward as the DRT and we have positive growth in the city, I just like to see that uh, we can kind of come up to kind of fair market value for the actual work. 17,000 EMS calls is tremendous, you know, the amount of work that they do on a daily basis. And it's very diverse from all the water rescue calls that we had last year. And it, it could be anything from hazmat structure fire. And so um, we're happy to work with management through collective bargaining to kind of make those increases uh, when we can. And so in, in light with that, um, we just want to make it Known that last year with the negotiating processes of all units, uh, we were um, basically we're about a percent and a half behind versus what uh, other unions received last year. There was, a, I guess, a, a different opinion from a previous city manager about um, pay. And so as positive growth and paying folks what, what kind of we, we would hope to for the right, having these great people in place, we'd like to definitely catch up in that process. Um, and that brings us to a situation we've faced for a while, and that's an issue with recruitment uh, and retention. And so over the last several year, years, we've noticed a difference. We've lost at least 10 members over the last, I'm sorry, 10% of our members over the last probably five years. Uh, people leave a lot of times uh, just to find uh, better wages a lot of times in a city that has a, a lower cost of living. And so those are things that we've been working on. Um, and a lot of it, in our opinion, is tied to a current base rate. You know, the base rate, doing a, uh, some basic review, we, you know, firefighter, the, a firefighter first year position in the last seven years really hasn't changed uh, a base rate other than a dollar and 62 cents in seven years. A 20 year captain uh, really hasn't changed much more than a dollar and 87 cents in that time. And so, again, through collective bargaining, we look forward to working with the city at, at, at kind of finding what is a fair market value and what's appropriate uh, with other departments our size that are doing this, uh, the same type of work. So uh, we've got a couple ideas uh, we, we will definitely share with you tonight uh, in the short term. We do have a, speaking of reten or recruitment, we, um, we had three recruits that didn't show up to the first day of the academy because they had found another job, another firefighting job. Um, and so what it's created is a nine person vacancy. And so what we'd like to do in the short term uh, to members to let them know that, that the city is working with them and, and we're working together collaboratively is we like to look towards a, um, a short term, whether we call it a, um, a bonus or a retention package that says, similar to what the POA had, where that, those funds for those nine percent or those nine persons are distributed to the membership in a one-time um, you know, retention package, uh, people signed to stay just like they did for the uh, police department. We think it's a great tool for them, and uh, we're just trying to recruit and keep um, the best people possible. So that would be the short-term fix that we're proposing. Um, and then through collective bargaining and hopefully with positive GRTs, we'd like to look at a base rate change um, again, because it, it really hasn't happened in the last seven years. 
but we're looking at, at hopefully a market change of five to nine percent over uh, several years, you know, or, or at least a three-year process and review as we go along. Uh, and what that will do too is we've had a, a, a unusual change of events lately. We've lost people that were at the middle or the end of their career to literally restart, uh, go to another state. We're captain's level positions, uh, and part of it is because our para system for fire is is in a unique, um, it's a difficult area. In 2016, PARA has changed the rules on what firefighters can report for earnings. I have to work 29, 12 hours a year, 2,912 hours. It's not an elective, it's required, but PARA will only accept 27, 2,756 hours. What that's created is 11% deficit. And so we're uh, working with uh, hopefully legislative changes that can work with that. We're uh, excited to work with city management to work through these problems. and. Um, I don't want to keep up too much of your time, but um, we definitely appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight and just some things to think about as we hopefully continue to see this positive growth for the city of Santa Fe. So again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Ms. McCoy, we have a, the internal audit. It looks like we're recommending a budget of $150,000. This went from an internal position to external last year. You're not recommending any other changes. Uh, so I'd like the committee to consider that within the next 15 minutes. Councilor, before you do that, could I get the permission to say a few words? It'll be brief. I will be brief, I promise you. I just want to thank uh, the speakers from the unions for being here today. Um, I think uh, the tone and the, the sense of working together that I got from just sitting here and listening is really what I most appreciate. I think we're we're finding a new way forward, and I think I endorse the comment that said, uh, "You know, this budget is a snapshot in time. It's not a it's not a destination." And we continue to see the need to read the market, to assess the market, to look at changes in the market, and uh, not just to do class and comp every three years with a fourth year of implementation, but to be dipping into and using data on a regular basis to update our sense of what's fair, what's equitable, and, and where problems are occurring with our really incredibly valued workforce. And I, We started out talking about a people first budget, and I, I, I really think that is what this budget is about. We are attempting to uh, make good for past uh, uh, under payments and also in the course of doing that really to strike a new tone in how we work with our union members, our non-union members, uh, with the leaders and to have a different set of relations. Uh, and I, I promise you that we will continue this dialogue going forward. Uh, we'll listen, come and sit in your meetings. Uh, we won't always agree, uh, but we'll always listen and it'll always be civil and it will always be respectful and it will always aim toward the same shared goal which is the best city to work for in the country in public safety in any part of our public service and uh, to work out our problems collaboratively so thank you very much for being here and for for your comments and for the the tone and the the sense of uh, collaboration that I think we're working on uh, every single day going forward. So I, I personally really appreciate that, and, and I promise you we'll keep working on our side in that same way. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. McCoy, the internal audit, is there anything about that budget that you'd like to highlight? I believe you stated earlier, Mr. Chairman, that we are appropriating, we are requesting a contract of $150,000 to continue on with the path that we have started this year in outsourcing the internal audit function. As you know, in previous years, we have had an FTE that has taken on this responsibility. In the current year, our uh, external internal auditor has produced a risk assessment for us with the plan uh, going forward. Uh, in the current year, we are uh, reviewing the procurement practices citywide. In addition to that, we will also be reviewing the contract process and the HR process and policies. Um, that would wrap it up for the current year and next year we would again review the risk assessment and determine which uh, internal audits we would be performing uh, throughout the course of FY20. Okay. 
Uh, Councillor Rivera. Thank you, uh, Ms. McCoy or, or uh, Mr. Littenberg. Who's um, managing the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, that fraud, waste, and abuse hotline is routed to the Human Resources Department, and they re they review the uh, the calls, incoming calls, in conjunction with our uh, city auditor's office. So, where's the budget for that? I know it's not a big budget, but that would be in the HR department. It is, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera. Yes. I think Bernadette. Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, I, I believe it's actually in the IT um, budget, but we can verify that and I'll give you that information by tomorrow. IT budget? I think so. Be Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, because that is the hotline and IT provides the services for um, our phone system. So the budget is there? So the calls get then routed to the HR department? Is that part happening? Yes, that is happening. All right. What if uh, somebody files a complaint against the HR department? Then that would go to the city manager's office. Okay. I think that's initially why we sort of set it up as an independent so that if a complaint came against the city manager or against the particular department that the internal auditor would handle it on their own separate from whatever department might be fielding the calls uh, and um, create some some potential issues with that so um, if you can put some thought into that mr. city manager and see if this is the best route to take or if maybe there are other other ways that we can do it that would uh, be fair and equitable to your council I'm happy to look at that thank you Councilor Lindell. thank you chair um, Ms. McCoy, what, what are the audits that we have planned to do? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Lindell, in the current year we have budget to, uh, we are currently conducting an audit of the procurement processes. This is in conjunction with rewriting the procurement manual that we will be bringing in front of this body for approval in the future. And in addition to that, we, uh, the first year of the risk assessment has identified uh, an audit of contracts and an audit of HR. Thank you. Uh, do we have a schedule for next year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Lindell, we will be reviewing uh, the schedule with the audit committee uh, for the subsequent year as after the funds are appropriated. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Councillor Romero, we so you're not going to be surprised by this question. Um, forensic audits, are we doing that? Are we planning for it? Are we thinking about it? Mr. Chairman, Councillor Romero-Worth, we have reached out to the Office of the State Auditor uh, so we can begin a forensic audit. Uh, we have to first notify the uh, Office of the State Auditor and discuss our plans uh, with his office. Uh, so we, that meeting is pending, um, and we can provide counselors with an update uh, subsequent to that meeting. Okay, thank you. And then also, um, are we, I haven't, uh, uh, Manager Litzenberg, you used to give us um, some updates on the McCard report and where you were in implementing recommendations. Is that something you're going to continue to do? Will we see that? as part of the work of, of the audits and um, things that are happening in the finance? Mr. Chair, members of the committee and council, um, that was something we were courting through a, a cross-department group. Um, I think it's something that we can bring back if it was of value to you to do regular reports from the card. It's not something I think specifically is being looked at by our external internal auditor. It's something we were doing as part of a a cross department communication plan with you all in the public. I just, I just think, you know, that was and remains in my mind a very important report, and I think we need to continue to understand where we are as a city in uh, addressing the things that were identified there. Um, I have a lot of faith in 
the team that's been assembled, and I just want to make sure that we're um, keeping on what that report identified and making sure that we're making the corrections given the new team that's in place. Councillor Harris. Councillor Villarreal. Councillor Leo Coppler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With regard to the internal audit, I know that there is uh, an item, or there, there, it was postponed on Public Works, and that's the same thing we've been talking about now, right? And there is a request. Ms. Mr. Chair, Councilor, yeah, it's a request. It's an amendment to the original contract with CICN. And um, is is it your intention to, or your goal, to someday bring that back internal to the city, or do we? intend to carry on contracting for internal audits with outside audit firms? Um, Mr. Chair, Councillor, um, when I walked in last year, it was something that we decided to do because I, I think we had no choice. We were forced into the decision, decision. It certainly made sense for year two to continue it because I think we had a clear course of action using a, a contractor who's been doing good work or the audit committee has appreciated working with. It's, um, I don't know that I know best practices, but it's something we can talk about.
Thank <laughs> you. 